I want to thank everyone for coming out here today, both in our live audience as well as those who are watching from their homes on YouTube. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we have an amazing panel for you. My name is Kevin Lynn. I am the co-founder of the Center for Progressive Urban Politics. And several years ago, Steve Lamb and I uh, founded CFPUP.org really to have that conversation about politics that pierces the veil of all that smog and fog that is out there. It's almost like a fog of war and really get away from left versus right, conservative versus liberal, and look to the, what's prudent for the, the, in terms of helping decide what the best course of action for us, either at the national level, the state <clears throat> level, or the community level is. And today, as I said, we have an amazing panel, and they're going to give a lot of insight into that. But before I begin, I'd like to, one, thank our sponsor for this event, and that is Progressives for Immigration Reform, who is without generous financial support, you know, we couldn't have made this possible today. And I would also like to uh, talk about a, another organization that some of the proceeds from the ticket sales will go to, and that is Respect Farmland, a watchdog group for Lancaster County. And Respect Farmland is an amazing group of activists who late last year came together initially to stop the construction of a 600 home development that threatened 75 acres of prime <clears throat> farmland here in Lancaster County. And the great thing is we were successful. And uh, since then, uh, activists at uh, Respect Farmland have been approached by people from other townships to assist also <coughs> in fighting development that threatens farmland. And so really glad to be able to assist uh, that group whenever we can. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our panel today. And I'm going to start uh, from left to right uh, in alphabetical order. And I'm going to start with uh, John Michael Greer. And John is an author and blogger and author of such works uh, as Dark Age America and Retrotopia. Mm -hmm. And John, but there's really the latest. You've written 42 books up mm -hmm. to this point. And I first uh, got exposed to your writings and your books and your blog because every week John does a, a blog that is really a novella, <laughs> it's, but it's so informative. And um, last year, January 2016, when you had all the prognosticators and the mainstream media and everywhere else predicting who would be president in January 2017, you said it was going to be Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was prophetic. And the reason you gave was he was the only one paying attention to <coughs> the issue of class warfare. And we're going to get into that today. Mm -hmm. So again, John, it's a real pleasure to have you here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Uh, and our next panelist is James Howard Kunstler. And uh, I got exposed, like many people, to Jim's work when you did that TED Talk on how bad architecture is destroying American cities. And uh, it was an amazing piece, the candor that you have. I've since read your books, such as The Geography of Nowhere, as well as uh, The Long Emergency. And I'm a faithful follower of your blog, whose name, well, I guess I could say it, but, you know. <laughs> well, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an amazing block, and you're doing that now two times a week, which is... Mondays and Fridays. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing oh. task. And one thing I, will, I want to bring your attention to before we begin, Jim, is I'm, I'm sure there's a point where, you know, the, the panelists on this stage and other activists, you know, are, you, you ask the question, am I making a difference? You know, what's the purpose here? And several years ago, when I lived in Los Angeles, I had taken my bicycle in to get repaired by this fellow named Joe Bray Ali. And we got talking and some other conversation turned to James Howard Kunstler. And so we're going on, on, on online and pulling down videos and everything. And this guy was an amazing, he was an activist for bike lanes and new urbanism. And two years ago, in 2015, he cut his hair and he ran for city council of Los Angeles in CD1. And 
two weeks ago, there was an election in Los Angeles. And in a four-way race, now it's a runoff in Los, that's the way they, they don't have primaries, they have a runoff election there. And Joseph was taking on an entrenched politician who'd been on the scene for 35 years in California politics. And the result was there's going to be a runoff election now between Joseph and this fellow Gil Cedillo. And it's just amazing. And I think the chances are very good that Joe is going to win that election. And so that was someone who was deeply influenced by your writing. Well, that settles it. I'm going to get a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And turning my attention, uh, Chris Martinson. Uh, Chris is the author, is an author, blogger. You have a site, peakprosperity.com, which I encourage everyone to visit. You've written two books. Um, the Crash Course, which is how I became familiar with you, and recently Prosper, which is you kind of lay out you know, ways to course correct, to better prepare for what's coming. And uh, Chris is also, uh, and, the, and when you read your work, it's one, it's so, it's, it, it's very easy to, to comprehend and get your head around, but you come at it with such a, a strong academic background, you have a, um, you have your MBA from Cornell, mm -hmm. your PhD from Duke, and your postgraduate work from Duke. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and it shows, because I'm a big fan of your podcasts uh, that come out almost, well, every other week, uh, usually. Uh, we can count on those to be out. And I know you got into town yesterday, and before you left, you did a podcast before you left. So. You're always working. <laughs> right, from the PhD and MBA to having a blog, so don't ask me about career advice. <laughs> <laughs> but we will ask you for advice on how to prepare for the upcoming uh, crash. Mm -hmm. Great, Thanks. and next uh, is Frank Morris. And uh, Frank, uh, I, I'm gonna have to read this because your academic credentials are so long. And no, you don't have to read it. That's <laughs> yeah, we've been around a long time, so. Right. Frank and I do go back a long way. But uh, Frank, you hold degree, you have you got your B, uh, bachelor's from Colgate, your MBA from Syracuse, or your, MP, uh, your MBA, and your doctorate from MIT. And then somewhere you got a degree from Georgetown as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> and Frank, uh, we've worked, as I, I consider Frank you to be a friend and a mentor of mine. Uh, we've been involved as activists on different issues for the past eight years, and you're, you just bring so much gravitas to any, any work that we're doing. Because uh, I'm a big guy, Kip. <laughs> <laughs> well, big body. You know, for instance, uh, you know, Frank, you specialize in immigration, poverty, environmental, higher education issues. Uh, you're the former executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, former dean of graduate studies at Morgan State University, former associate dean at the Graduate School of Public Affairs, University of Maryland, and a former senior foreign service officer for, with the Agency for International Development. And it was interesting, I was actually out in Los Angeles just a couple weeks ago, and. I met a woman who I'd met through Facebook because she was sharing a video of you from YouTube. And she's like, oh my God, I love Frank Morris. He just, he's just so bright. And I messaged her back. I said, you know, I know Frank Morris. And came back, OMG, you know Frank Morris. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really great to have you here, Frank. Thank and, you, Kim. And last but surely not least is Dmitry Orlov. And Dmitry, is an author and blogger, and he had his, uh, he's the author of books such as uh, Shrinking the Technosphere, uh, Shrinking the Technosphere, and Reinventing Collapse. And I first got exposed to you in reinvent, with Reinventing Collapse, where you took a look at what happened in the, you had gone back to chronicle what had happened in the Soviet Union, and began to draw parallels for how that could help us with our upcoming uh, collapse crap. preparedness. Collapse preparedness. And uh, you're also an engineer as well as an author. Uh, I would like to direct people to your, your, your blog site, which is cluborlov.com. 
And uh, you're also not just an author, but a publisher as well with uh, the Club Orlov Press. And it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Dimitri. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. So how about a big hand for all of our panelists? <laughs> this is actually going to be the most easy moderator job a person could have, because I don't think that you have to say much of anything to get this group of people started. So, but I would like to start off with the, uh, the what do they call it, the thousand pound gorilla in the room or the mm -hmm. elephant in the room. On January 20th, uh, Donald Trump became the 45th president of the United States. And I'd like to ask the panel, what happened? You know, why did he win? And uh, what were the forces at work that propelled him into the presidency? Well, I'd like to start, I'd like to sure. take that if you don't mind, just for starters. Um, in some ways, this is one of those really overdetermined situations. It's like the victim in a bad mystery novel who gets shot and stabbed and poisoned and clobbered <laughs> over the head and then thrown off a 20 story window into the sea. Um, there were a lot of factors leading to, leading to Trump's victory. Um, some of which, of course, I talked about in advance. But two of the, the two factors that I think um, deserve headliner here is, first of all, um, the simple fact that Hillary Clinton ran probably the least competent presidential campaign in my lifetime. And I've been watching presidential campaigns since Hubert Humphrey. Okay? It, she did an, a, an abysmally bad job in trying, she never gave the American people any reason to think that they would be improved by having her in the White House, by their situation would be better, that their lives would be better, um, outside of a small inner circle of affluent people whose lives are doing pretty well anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so so her, her campaign was dismally bad, and uh, probably almost anybody could have defeated her the way things were run. And of course, the worst thing is she ran ident an identical campaign in 2008 and lost then too. So she sh she's not exactly good at learning from her mistakes. But the broader factor at work here is simply that so many people wanted, desperately needed change, which Real was change. one thing that she was not willing to provide or not willing to promise or offer. Um, she was a candidate of business as usual. Um, I want to just, uh, no, not, not to monopolize too much, I want to tell just a very brief story here. Because I live in the north central Appalachians, in an old mill town that used to have industry and doesn't anymore. Just south of where I live is one of the really poor parts of town. It is a mixed race part of town, part of town by which I don't just mean there are some black people here, some white people here. You walk down on a summer afternoon and the people sitting on a porch downing some beers are not of the same skin color. There are a lot of um, mixed race couples, there are a lot of multiracial children there. It's very, very poor. This was the first neighborhood in town where Donald Trump signs started appearing. Okay. All the Hillary Clinton signs were in the rich part of town. That, I've seen that repeated over a vast amount of middle America, all over the flyover states, precisely because you know, the people who are well off could afford to think that, okay, well, we can just go for another four years of the same thing. The people who are not well off, the 80% of Americans who are struggling these days, they can't afford another four years of business as usual, and they were willing to vote for anybody who would promise them something different. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it's, danger Dimitri? it's dangerous to oversimplify, but um, uh, perhaps sometimes it's useful. So as an engineer, I like to draw diagrams, and I drew a Venn diagram, and in one circle is uh, people able to win the Republican primary, and the other one is people able to lose against Hillary Clinton. And the overlap between the two circles turns out to be a null set. So that made Trump <laughs> inevitable. Yes. I don't think he was inevitable because Clinton did win the popular vote. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were about three different things. I think you're absolutely right. One was the, the class effect, mm -hmm. that people were hurting. And white people are hurting. I mean, it's nothing new for black folks to be hurting. But white folks were hurting who were being ignored and who, are, who still are being ignored by both parties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, the class effect. Uh, also, the, uh, what Trump ran on was against Wall Street. Hey, hey, you remember that? He was running against, he was going to trade the swap of all folks. He was going to trade the swap so that. And the third thing was immigration. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't want to, it's like the boogeyman in the room. If we're going to talk about reality, we're going to talk, you know, as if there is one view on immigration and that it's 
that immigrants and this whole issue is whether the good guys and the bad guys is to try to make it a, 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 a factor of, of, of one or either one against the other, it's either you're for it or you're against it, it's, and, and not recognize that uh, it's a multifaceted kind of thing, that there are people, there are Americans who are herded, that you don't, it, it, that labor is not exempt from the law of supply and demand. Thank you. And that the other thing which we don't talk about, and Trump didn't really talk about it. He didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about it well. He could have <laughs> exploited it. But that, uh, in, in, in reality, uh, Americans really have sort of written off some of the folks who were, who actually are hurt by the immigration. If we're talking about the uh, National Academy of Science study, it's less skilled, less educated, African Americans, Hispanic, and in the workforce. And increasingly, the limits of options that affect uh, when you have uh, deindustrialization now. Increasingly, you have, you know, in, especially in the Rust Belt, white workers who are also now caught in this downward spiral and jobs that are not simply available. And even the lower level jobs are, are not available because when you have eight and a half million illegal workers working and eight million Americans looking for jobs of any kind and another three to four million who want full time employment, you've got an issue that deserves to be addressed not as an either or, good or bad, but as a recognition that choices have to be made, that when you make certain choices, others are hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, to, to build on what, what Frank was saying there, um, about 1970, the, the ability of a single earner to support a household hit a peak, and it's been going down ever since for the median income at this point in time. Mm -hmm. To me, Trump was all but inevitable, and my, my flip statement now to people is, um, if we don't correct the monetary policies in this country, which are deeply unfair, deeply. Remember, it was last year, Oxfam ran a study and found that 62 people had as much wealth as 3.5 billion, billion people, people on the planet. They ran the study this year, in 2016, last year, and that number was just eight. So, and they present like, oh, isn't this just a, it's like a, a comet flew by, weird, right? <laughs> no, this is a policy. The reason those people got wealthier, the reason the 0.1% are getting wealthier is because of policies of the Federal Reserve that are taking economic oxygen away from everybody and handing it to a very small group of people. That's not monetary policy, that is social engineering and it's political engineering. It has consequences and we're seeing it all over the world. Marine Le Pen in France, I'll guarantee she's gonna get more votes than they're predicting for the same reason that Trump did. People are embarrassed mm -hmm. to admit it, but they're feeling the pain, right? Italy, same thing. Brexit, same Brexit. thing. Mm -hmm. These are all connected events, and until we understand that landscape, you know, you can parse down into was it white voters or black voters or this. Forget that. We're being deeply unfairly treated by a system that I think Hillary represented in spades. Mm -hmm. Trump pretended like he was something different, mm -hmm. but all the Goldman Sachs people he brought on board <laughs> maybe says he wasn't that different. <laughs> but my flip answer is if you don't like who Trump was, you're going to hate who comes next mm -hmm. unless we fix this. Because that unfairness is easy for somebody to come along and promise the world to, and that person might not be somebody we like very much. But that's really the context I see in the story. Yeah, me too. Well, um, yeah. Trump won the election because Hillary uh, won bigly in the wrong states and, and <laughs> lost bigly in the right states. And um, uh, she's, uh, tr Trump, both Trump and Hillary uh, represented the incoherence of our economic system, because the, the incoherence of our economic system is kind of bleeding over now, being expressed by our politics. And uh, there's a very important word that we don't use when we're talking about what's going on in our country, and that word is racketeering. Everything has turned into a racket in the American economy and in American political and social life. And um, I think the voters, very clearly recognized that Hillary Clinton represented political racketeering at its most visible. And uh, um, she alienated the voters that way. You know, um, f for, f for all the, uh, the uh, lack of finesse in Hillary's campaign that uh, John Michael described, let's remember that Trump was uh, extraordinarily incoherent during the campaign and remains incoherent mm -hmm. as president. Um, and, and I don't think that he's going to be able to either articulate 
the true nature of the, of the problems that we're faced with or navigate us through it. And uh, we do have reason to be um, pretty concerned about what comes next. Mm -hmm. I, I also don't think that he's going to make it through his entire term. So uh, uh, we have a big problem in this country. I, I, would, I would summarize it by saying this. We don't have a coherent idea of what's happening to us. We can't construct a coherent narrative about uh, the reality that we inhabit, and we can't uh, uh, produce a coherent plan for what to do. I, I Jim, would, uh, I just want to say, go ahead, go following ahead. through what you just said about racketeering, uh, Hillary was perceived as the continuation of the Obama administration. And what we don't sure. want to often acknowledge, at least some of us who voted for him in 08, uh, was that his refusal to either in, uh, to prosecute uh, those who were uh, in violation of, uh, of Geneva Convention rules on one hand, or uh, the absolute fraud, and it was clearly mm -hmm. fraud, mm -hmm. of yeah. the financial the holder in, in, in Obama is a, is a reinforcement of that that also was beneath the surface that people clearly felt that affected and, the Democrats. And I, I like to uh, use the term uh, to describe what our society became as a result of, of that as a society in which anything goes and nothing matters. Mm -hmm. And that's a very dangerous place for society to get. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that I, I want to pick up on what Frank said, which is that the perception is very important. and. Donald Trump is the most pessimistic president and was the most pessimistic presidential candidate that I've ever witnessed. The, the whole slogan of make America great again means mm -hmm. that America isn't that great anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it can be made great again, you know, he'll maybe try, uh, but he's more interested in destroying things that don't work than in building things that do. Look at what he's doing to Obamacare. He said, well, Obamacare is going to just explode, crash and burn. It's already happening. Eventually, people will be paying ridiculously high premiums, and their deductibles are higher than the amount of money they have. So, ergo, they're not going to get any medical care anyway. So why not just let it explode? That was his plan A. His plan B was to try some kind of reform. Plan B failed. Now it's back to plan A. So he's just a completely pessimistic person. But the reason it works is because it's a completely pessimistic country. So the people mm -hmm. are fed up listening to optimists when, mm -hmm. when that optimism is completely unsubstantiated by the reality that the people experience in their daily lives. So he was a breath of fresh air because he's a, he's a pessimist. Mm -hmm. So it goes from new, mor new morning in America or a new dawn in America to let's make America great again Maybe. because it isn't. Yeah. But wasn't that an optimistic statement because he was saying it to people that America was great at a certain time when things were better for them, but maybe not for all Americans. <laughs> but it was really bad. but in, in, the, in the most benign part, it was great when there was manufacturing jobs where mm -hmm. you get a high school education, you can get things and so mm -hmm. forth like that. The, the malignant part, of course, was that for many of the folks who were during those times, Americans who were not benefiting from that. Well, it's nostalgia. It's, yes. You know, it's, it basically, it's a return to nostalgia. It has to be an optimistic uh, slogan because this is America, and here optimism is obligatory. But this is very pessimistic sort of optimism, if, mm -hmm. you, if you really look at it. Well, I think part of it is simply that um, Donald Trump was one of the very few people who, were will who was willing to admit that there was actually a problem to be solved. Exactly. Um, I mean, over and above, is, is it optimism? Well, you know, make America great again. Actually admitting, I mean, the, you, you recall the flurry when he, when he started, mm -hmm. when he mentioned on, um, in an interview, somebody said, well, well, Vladimir Putin is a killer. And he was saying, well, yeah, we've got lots of killers too. And people wept themselves. <laughs> people just wept themselves because you don't talk that way about the United States, even though, of course, he's true. <coughs> or he's right in that situation, he was telling the truth, which is not what we expect from our politicians. But John, yeah. how can, uh, why did Trump win in the Republican Party when Bernie didn't win in the Democratic Party? Because the Republican Party is more democratic than the Democratic Party. Um, the Republican Party was not able to squeeze him out while the Democrats rigged the primary, blatantly, um, which is why we don't have President Sanders right now. I'm quite convinced that if, if Bernie Sanders had, take, had gotten the nomination that he earned, um, that the result, he would have walked right over Trump. Mm -hmm. You have two candidates promising change, and one of them actually looks like he'll deliver. Um, 
he would have won. I know people who voted for Trump who said, yeah, I kind of like Sanders. I know of nobody who voted for Trump who could stand Hillary Clinton. Hmm. And, you know, it's not a matter of gender. Many of these people are very, are very, they like, they have female politicians that they like a great deal, just not that one. Well, and she was, to me, a continuation of more of the same, right, yeah. which was highly corrupt and deeply unfair, right? Mm -hmm. So the same time Ferguson is exploding and we're discovering the Department of Justice comes into Ferguson after that whole Michael Brown shooting and discovered that in a town of 20,000 people, there were 16,000 outstanding warrants. Yeah. The people were walking ATMs to a corrupt, venal justice system where the cops and the courts were treating everybody who was walking around like they could get some Money extractable from cash from. So the law works for us, but it wasn't working for Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so that's, Hillary was just a continuation of that yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting was looking at the Sanders rallies. Yes, mm -hmm. they were 10 times larger than Hillary, and that's being generous to Hillary, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Maybe 100 times larger in some cases. In some cases, yes. But the age demographic mm -hmm. clearly showed the same thing that we saw with Ron Paul, who also mm -hmm. surprised me, 30 and under, that's his crowd. Exactly. Old white guy is crazy, right? But what it said is we have a looming generational mm -hmm. storm coming here where mm -hmm. the young people don't see anything, including my children. They look in the future and they say, hang on, D minus infrastructure, student debt, the only non-dischargeable form of debt in debt, America yes. today, mm -hmm. crumbling this and that. You know, it's just, what did you guys spend the money on? And I think the boomers have a lot to answer for. And there mm -hmm. was a whole attempt to just pretend that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. stronger together. That was the slogan. I'm like, <laughs> That hasn't been true so far, so no, uh, like, can we start over with that one? No, the, the, so that's what both of them, you know, I worked as a corporate strategist for a long time in a strategy. There's fancy things you can do, and they're all the same. Where are you going? How are you going to get there? Mm -hmm. What's your vision? What are your resources? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything from either party that says, here's where we want to go and why, and here's how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. With the energy we have remaining, with the yeah. dollars we <laughs> have yet to spend, all of that stuff, it's just that's missing. Uh -huh. And for young people to come into a story, we're asking them, hey, step in enthusiastically into this American dream narrative. And it hasn't been explained, and it doesn't make sense. That's the world we live in. That's uncomfortable. And, and that's where I think a lot of people are starting to feel that deep discomfort that you get when your main story is broken and mm -hmm. nobody's talking about it. And it seems like it's starting to manifest politically mm -hmm. now. Uh, just the other day, I was having coffee with someone who mentioned a young woman who was running for the school board here. Uh, she's in her 20s, and she really doesn't want to align with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. they really, she she's really sees herself more as an independent, maybe more leanings to the Democratic Party, but things are changing. And I love where this discussion is going because I think mm -hmm. we're down this great rabbit hole mm -hmm. where you know, there's some things that we can't talk about and other things we can. And I'd like to quote something from uh, Krista Freeland. She wrote a book called The uh, Plutocrats, The Rise yes. of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, and I quote, I was once told by the head of a prestigious think tank in Washington, DC, that the think tank's board was very unlikely to fund any work that had income or wealth inequality in its title, yes, they would finance anything to do with poverty alleviation, but inequality was another was an altogether different matter. Okay. Why is that? Why can't like you had mentioned? You know, Trump said something that people just don't say. Why can't we have that conversation on inequality and what is driving it? Well, now it's very easy to talk about the top the 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 point one percent, okay, and there, it's very popular to focus the entire conversation about class in America as though it's just the top 1% or 0.01% versus everyone else. What we don't want to talk about is the differentiation between the upper 20% and everyone else, between, let's, let's use some simple labels, the salary class, the people who get their income primarily by salary, <coughs> and the wage class, the people who earn an hourly wage. There are huge differences there are huge differences in how they've been treated over the last 30 years. If you're in the salary class, unless you're right down at the bottom being pushed out into wage work, um, your health care is probably paid for by your employer. If you're in wage class, forget it. If you're in the salary class, you're doing about as well as people did in the salary class 20 years ago. If you're in the wage class, your income has been destroyed. You may be working three jobs, part-time, minimum wage, no benefits, in a desperate attempt to keep your family fed. That's the reality in the wage class these days. And nobody wants to talk about that 
because we have to start talking about inequalities that don't just have to do with um, snidely whiplash in the, in the point, the point zero one percent. We can't just point off somewhere else at some other person being evil. We have to look at ourselves. We have to look at our own lifestyles. We have to say, okay, is my lifestyle being propped up by the destruction of the working class? And guess what? If you're in the salary class, yes, it has been. You've benefited by the destruction of the American working class. Is that and because nobody, people get their lawns done for cheap? And their, the, yeah. ba economic policy in the United States for the last, since, since, since um, Ronald Reagan came in, um, around in 1981, has been focused on keeping the middle class happy by driving down the price of everything. And that requires offshoring jobs mm -hmm. to third world hell holes so that they can be made cheaply. It involves- Tax cuts. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. tax cuts. It involves importing labor um, to, at, at the bottom to drive, again, you were talking about the law of supply and demand. It applies to labor. If you increase the supply of laborers and you decrease the demand for laborers, guess what? Wages go down. down. And it sounds really good if you're sitting in a corporate boardroom and saying, yeah, our labor costs have gone down by 15%. But what that means is that people who are depending on those wages to feed their children no longer have that kind of, the income they need. And so basically the acquiescence, the compliance of the middle class for the social changes has been purchased at the expense of throwing America's once, once strong working class under the bus and then driving the wheels back and forth across it for 30 years. <laughs> well, I want to say something about the, uh, Go ahead. The, 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 what you're painting as a victim class, the working class, because um, another, thing, another way that we don't talk about this is how uh, they have been um, com compliant in their own destruction. Mm -hmm. Uh, back in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, I went around to a lot of uh, permitting meetings in the, towning, in the town planning boards for Walmarts and, and big box stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, invariably, there would be a group of working people there saying, we want bargain shopping, we want bargain shopping. And so they, you know, they would, they would uh, uh, force the, the town board to... Um, let the Walmart come into their town, and the Walmart would destroy every small business in the town. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a lot of these people were out of jobs forever. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think that there's plenty of blame to, oh. to spread around. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize how we have um, authored our, uh, the destruction of our own society. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the, sa the complacence of the salary no. class. It, it, yeah. you know, it, no. it, it goes across the whole society. But the complacence it, it, of the it's salary really class deeper. has to. It's really deeper than that. Yeah. At the root of this, Americans don't talk about equality because mm -hmm. Americans worship individualism. Mm -hmm. There's not a, a, a belief in a social contract or, or mm -hmm. the, the, the fake ideology of the Judeo-Christian Islamic society. That's really not really what, we, what Americans believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right, it's materialism. But this individualism is very important for Americans mm -hmm. uh, because uh, by focusing on individualisms, you can uh, justify whatever class status you have mm -hmm. as a result of you or your ancestors' drive, determination, the Nile of gratification. You ignore both historical and structural barriers mm -hmm. that, you know, finally some people realize, you, you realize that up against, you're more likely to realize these barriers when you happen to you when you're out of a job and when you're out faced by these mm -hmm. other kinds of structural things that are brought about to support mm -hmm. the one and a half percent. But until then, there's this assumption. And it really hurts, hurts our children mm -hmm. because they, they're growing up. They see the differences in our society. And if they are not taught that so much of this reality is not true, uh, uh, the reality that assumes that America is a meritocracy society, mm -hmm. the reality that assumes the upward mobility in America is one of the best in all the developed world when it really isn't then they have no other basis of understanding mm -hmm. these differences. And so they become susceptible mm -hmm. to these arguments that, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that artificial categories like race or, 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 or like class are not due to structural policies and things, mm -hmm. but are due to individual weaknesses. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, it, and yeah. so, so therefore, you know, uh, if, if I'm benefiting from that, if mm -hmm. I want to believe that, if I don't want to believe that I'm or my family is a result of privileged history, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's threatening to me mm -hmm. when you 
when you do that. So it's much more acceptable to believe in this, uh, this myth that everything is individual responsibility. You know, and that and that we have, we live in the most open, vibrant, like <laughs> <laughs> what 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 you guys what we're all around here is saying the most open, vibrant, uh, uh, health, best in the world, health <coughs> kinds of, of of reality that is not reality. I think I have a, a short answer to the question that you posed originally. Why is the subject of inequality rarely discussed, or why a discussion of that subject is not encouraged at all? And I think that that's because inequality in the United States is actually an engineered product. Uh, if, if, you're, if you start out poor, then uh, making a little bit more money uh, means that you're going to lose your subsidized housing. You're going to lose your free care, whatever free care you, you manage to get. You're not, you're not going to get food stamps. Um, all of these things are basically headwinds. And all you have to do to generate those hand headwinds is start making more money. So a lot of people in the United States are smart enough to know that they have something to gain by stay, staying poor. And this, is, this has been organized. This has been put into place. Other policies that destroy families by making, uh, making fathers irrelevant or sending them to, to jail for various victimless crimes, all of those things are basically designed to make it so that the poor want to stay poor. Now, discussing that is politically very charged. It's a, it's a very fraught subject. People don't want to think that they're actually creating an underclass with their social policies. Um, and I think that that's the, that's the reason that you know, these think tanks shy away from the subject. Well, especially when, especially when a lot of those policies are put in place with good intentions. Uh -huh. I mean, let, <laughs> let, let's not, let's not uh, delude ourselves into thinking that uh, these things were engineered necessarily by evil evil spirits who wanted to do harm to those people. You know, a lot of that stuff was done with the best of intentions. Well, it's and that's one of the reasons we can't really talk about it, you know, because, because uh, we're, the, the shame and disappointment of, you know, of the failure of those policies mm -hmm. is so tremendous that we can't have an honest conversation but about guys, it. But guys, what am I missing here? I mean, I don't know of any poor people who want to stay poor. Uh, I mean, uh, they're, in, they're in a system to survive. Mm -hmm. And when they're trying to survive, they, they develop many kinds of different mechanisms. But, but it's not out of a choice. For a matter of fact, many of them, and, and I go across race on there, identify with the, with the rich. Oh, they believe this. Oh, no, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't want to uh, overtax the rich. That's an that's incentive for them. Uh, I've seen the poor more identify mm -hmm. with you know, sometimes those who are bringing oppression and did not want, didn't want to stay, they want to be out of that. They oh, don't absolutely. want to. They this, don't want to. I don't think either I'm, of us are I'm making the point that they, that no, they no, want to yeah, stay yeah, poor. What okay. I'm saying is that you're absolutely right, you know, that, that <clears throat> culturally poverty is extremely unattractive across the board. The problem is you make more money, it makes you more poor. That's, that's, the, that's the trap. And, and uh, because that trap is, is built into how poverty is financed, it is very difficult for a lot of people to escape from that trap. You have you have to leapfrog over Leap more, much a more huge money. Pay scale. Make you have to go from zero additional. to six figures somehow. Mm -hmm. Well, not quite six figures. Well, but six <laughs> figures is where people feel comfortable. In this <laughs> well, the, the, the break-even line in, in my county in Massachusetts, because I know somebody who's on disability, uh, she's been there a while. Uh, she would have to earn forty-eight thousand five hundred to equal the benefits that come from being on disability on and Medicare, mass, and so mass so yeah. health, Medicare, yeah. all mm -hmm. of that. Yes. And that's a tall order in a county where our median income for a household, which is two earners, is less than that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, now, I, now, the interesting thing here is that this focus on individualism doesn't actually go back all that far in American history. When Alexis de Tocqueville tour toured this country, in the decades immediately after the revolution, one of the things he commented on was the extent to which Americans organized groups to do everything. Any kind of thing they wanted to do, whether it was to raise, it, to build a church, to do civic improvements, to do this, to do that. All the funerals. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, pay, provide sick pay back when there was no social safety net. Americans were at the, at the cutting edge of social organization. As recently as the middle of the 20th century, when the union movement was big, you know, there, there was this idea that there was actually, there was strength in numbers. You join together. You don't try to go it on your own because you'll be crushed. 
And somehow that got lost. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the angles that um, could be pursued, that, that ought to be pursued perhaps, in, in figuring out how people can get themselves out of the mess that we're in. Because the help is not going to be handed down by the people who are already privileged. And there have been a loss of organizational strengths too. Oh, I know. I'm just speaking the, the African American community. Mm -hmm. Things which I guess from segregation mm -hmm. forced this unity. Sometimes mm -hmm. it was that led to some of the black colleges, sometimes mm -hmm. it was the women's black women's groups, mm -hmm. sometimes the black fraternities, the mm -hmm. black Masonic groups. Mm -hmm. Many of these things are now mm -hmm. have have weakened as oh, Putnam yeah. in his book mm -hmm. Bowling Alone yeah. shows. So uh, and I think that but we haven't recognized that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's as if this is, is concurrently going on, mm -hmm. and things are going on around us, and, and no one has any answers, or no one is willing to recognize. By the way, a, a lot of a lot of uh, the uh, uh, poverty and economic issues are also fall into the racketeering folder. Let's not forget that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you have to go all the way back to Alexis de Tocqueville to find an America that, you know, no. was the can-do nation that made things work. That carried, you know, basically cared a lot about results and mm -hmm. didn't care too much about whose feelings got hurt along the way. That, mm -hmm. that was the America that I saw when I came here in the 70s. Mm -hmm. It was tough people that got things done. And mm -hmm. now you have soft people who care about their own feelings. Mm -hmm. that, that's a big shift. That's a big cultural shift. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. And that was engineered in the universities, I, I think believe. so, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about this. The, the, the soft people because folks are struggling. Mm -hmm. And when you're struggling, you know, uh, you either, if you're in charge, it's racketeering. If you're not, you're hustling to survive. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so both no, of them I, require I, I, a great deal of, of energy uh -huh. and yeah. uh, different, a different kind mm -hmm. of, of, of way mm -hmm. of trying to uh, adjust to power. Mm -hmm. Now, it, that thing though about not talking about it, why don't we talk about it? I'm at the point now, I, I think it's, it's gone beyond an oversight. Uh, this is an active policy of suppressing this discussion of inequality. Nobody wants to be accused of stider, starting a class war. <laughs> but let's be clear, 2014, Janet Yellen, chairman of the Federal Reserve, gets up and gives a talk and she said, and she talked directly about inequality and gave three prime reasons for it. One was early childhood education, need to do better at it. Number two, Americans needed to be more entrepreneurial. Number three, it really helps if you had a big inheritance coming from your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not, those were the factors she identified, and she is, number one, more responsible for the wealth inequality than anybody else. She blamed the victim, and nobody in the press said anything but, those are real good pearls of insight, Ms. Yellen. We'll write them all down. Yeah. Right? The first thing should have been somebody standing there going, BS, that is complete junk. Mm -hmm. you need to, I mean, it's just... It's astonishing that yeah. we have so little context in our media mm -hmm. that she could get away with saying that and nobody said anything except the blogosphere. Yeah, here, well, here again though, I think um, one of the problems, and this is something we also saw very substantially with, with the whole Trump business, the echo chamber of the privileged, okay? There are things you don't talk about if you're comfortable in this country. Inequality is a major one of them. Um, you, know, you don't talk about systemic issues like that. The amount of things that you can talk about has actually narrowed dramatically. Um, Dimitri, you're, you're a specialist on the last years of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent did, this, did that kind of thing spread through the Soviet media and Soviet conversation at the same time, where among the people whose voices were um, available to the public? Well, it, during the final agony of the Soviet Union, nothing was discussed, and then Gorbachev came to power and uh, announced this policy of glasnost. Uh -huh. You would no longer get persecuted or locked up by speaking the truth. Uh -huh. And uh, what erupted was this uh, basically uh, nervous breakdown on the scale of a, a large nuclear superpower that, that caused it to fall apart relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. A lot of what passed for truth was actually, you know, fake news and mm -hmm. contemporary parlance. Um, lo all sorts of numbers got, got exaggerated. People got a really bad impression of what their country was actually like. Mm -hmm. They lost track of what was good about it. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a, a, a net positive for the, for the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. I think it was necessary because what came before was just this protocol where you, you, you receive a sheet of instructions and you read from it. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody else has to nod. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't work very well. 
but what came after didn't work very well either. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. The opposite of one bad idea is usually another bad idea. Exactly. <laughs> but I think right now we have two things going on in this country. One is that, you know, there's the, there's the echo chamber of, of, of mass media and, and people in the Beltway and people on Wall Street, and, and they're in a world of their own. They, they, they live in some kind of a manufactured reality which no longer connects in any way <coughs> with physical mm -hmm. reality. And then you have everybody else being very confused, legitimately confused, because nobody's telling them <coughs> what to think, and they haven't been trained to think for themselves. <laughs> They've been trained not to think for themselves. Exactly. Yeah. With, with, terrible, with oh. terrible costs, especially if we look at the work of uh, Deaton and Case uh, from Princeton about the increasing death rate of mm -hmm. wh white male Americans with mm -hmm. college degrees or less. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, African Americans have also suffered from this environment, but it's been much longer. And, you know, we've, yeah. we've adjusted with, with very negative social consequences that are now beginning to, mm -hmm. you know, to hit deeper in America and in rural America, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, oh, yes. that's, uh, so there are consequences of that. Mm -hmm. the, um, Earlier, someone had mentioned that, you know, if you're concerned about Trump, wait till, see, to wait, if he fails, wait, wait to see what happens, what, what comes along next. And, you know, often when I'm a little confused about what's going on in the world, I pick up Thucydides' uh, history of the Peloponnesian Wars, and it all just seems to be that playing out again. We have the rise of these, you know, where you had the rise of demagogues, you know, people who, you know, again, people were confused at the time. They were uh, suffering. And there were these very talented uh, individuals that were able to arise, maybe not necessarily competent, but very talented, who could arise, attract their attention, and uh, get them to uh, support them politically. And mm -hmm. that's, that could be dangerous. It, it, it is dangerous. But it's something that happens at this. Here we're going to get into awkward territory, which is that history does rhyme. And the conviction that history has nothing to teach us except the mistakes that people made way back then when we were all stupid. Um, we have to get past that. We have to recognize that we are in a, a kind of historical period, a kind of phenomenon that has happened many times before. Um, if you want to go back to Polybius, mm -hmm. the, the Greek historian, who talked about how democracies come unglued. And you'll get a, you'll get a very familiar glimpse. The one way in which that tends to get um, brought out is that everybody lost, likes to talk about Weimar Germany. Everyone likes to paint the little square mustache on the, whatever politician they don't like. And that can be useful on occasion. But we're taught this is a broader situation. This is how democracies decline and fall. I know those are probably the two least, fam least favorite words in modern American parlance, but that happens. I think that there's a lot of psychological value to reading uh, Suetonius, Polybius, people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when George Bush got elected and there was this march to war, uh, you know, they, they were preparing to invade Afghanistan before 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not. Um, oh, yeah. And, and uh, I, I realized that this was happening and, and it made me sick. And, and the way I overcame this, this nausea that all of this produced as me was uh, by reading The Twelve Caesars. Hmm. Uh, and that made me realize that, you know, this just goes around in circles, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And this mm -hmm. is just more of the same. So nothing to worry about, just like, you know, take care of your own business and, and this will get even worse. And there's nothing <laughs> we can do to stop and it. That's, and that's the unthinkable thing because of the, the sort of toxic optimism that has become so pervasive in our society. Everything has to be upbeat. We have to put f fish hooks in our lips and draw them up into a rictus and pretend that nothing can ever be wrong, that we're on our way to some kind of imaginary Star Trek future metastasizing across the galaxy or something, when we're not. And it's not working. That's what it's I not would working. point out. It's Hillary not working. Hillary Clinton is Mrs. Rictus. You know, you look at how she smiles. That's mm -hmm. not a smile. That's called mm -hmm. rictus. It's mm -hmm. a yeah. medical term. It's a, it's a nervous grimace. Mm -hmm. The woman but is incapable of smiling. I, I've never met her, I wouldn't know. But, but the thing is, we have, we have this folk mythology of perpetual progress yes. glued into place in our imaginations. And the fact that progress could be followed by regress, that rise is followed by decline and fall. 
is unthinkable to most Americans, and yet that's the reality we're experiencing right now. And, and we do Black have Americans oh. do not. I, 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 <laughs> let's get straight. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. And I'm sure that's true of most people of color. They know better. But their voices are not the ones being fed back to us yeah. all through the echo chamber yeah. of the media. And so we have this fantasy that, that, there's a, that you can be on the right side of history. How often have we seen, heard that label recently? You know, history doesn't have sides. It doesn't play favorites. It's not going anywhere. But we believe it is because we have this, this folk mythology of progress that we insist on mapping even as our infrastructure collapses, even as our standards of living slide, even as the biosphere comes unglued. We're, we've got food on well, well, let, let me, let me yeah. pick up on that go because ahead, um, I've been recently, I've been playing the role of the Lorax in all the talks I, I go and give. Ah. Um, I gave a talk at, at NASA during one of their 100 year uh, planning cycles at the UN, variety of places. And mm -hmm. I start my talk now with the rusty patch bumblebee. Mm -hmm. The rusty patch bumblebee is now on the endangered species list, fish and wildlife, put it there. Do you know who fought that tooth and nail, the one lobbying group that fought the inclusion of the bumblebee hardest? Who? It's the American Farm Bureau. Mm -hmm. How far off the reservation are you when the Farm Bureau is the one fighting the inclusion of the bumblebee, which is an essential creature, right? So to me, that just hits me in the gut. Like that actually makes me very upset. Um, this is the part of the story where I cry. You know, I get, I get really, my heart is broken by the idea of the loss of sentinel species. Not because they perform essential pollination services that make us billions of dollars of tomatoes, but because it's a bumblebee and it has a place in life. Mm -hmm. And so I give this talk and, um, you know, at NASA I expected a little of this, but I usually get somebody in the audience going, oh, 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 Chris. They're making drone bumblebees now, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of those will you have to make, too? <laughs> well, that's the appropriate question. So who's going to make billions of them and plug the little charging wires in every night? You know? <laughs> Think it through, people. I mean, it's just, it's in, so, but once you lose a bumblebee, though, no amount of optimism is going to get it back. Once you lose it, it's gone, mm -hmm. right? And once it's gone, every single thing that it pollinates is no longer on the menu. And by the way, bumblebees perform something called vibration pollination. No other insect performs it. They're gone. Everything they pollinate mm -hmm. gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And who knows with unknowable impacts. So the only way I got to the NASA guys was yeah. this one guy was like, yeah, but, you know, dro drones. I said, how would you feel if somebody went into the space station, some numbnut, and started removing components from the oxygen generator? <laughs> <laughs> and he blanched, he said, that would be a very bad idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that, exactly. Yeah. No, but what, 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 you, we had a conversation a while back where you talked about the iPhone moment. Right. Okay. And the moment when you're trying to communicate this kind of thing to people, and a whole bunch of young people, usually in the back, in the back rows, will hold up their iPhones as proof that you must be wrong. Okay, because <laughs> it's technology. Okay. But you know, it's interesting because there are things that do jump off the pages and scream course correction at mm -hmm. us. And, you know, just uh, a month ago, we had the Oroville Dam in California. It's mm -hmm. the highest dam in the United States. And because of neglect, simple neglect, uh, in 2005, activists tried to sue the state to uh, do the necessary repairs to the spillway, the maintenance on the spillway and other features of the dam, but all, all glossed over mm -hmm. other priorities. I couldn't imagine what for the, everyone living downstream from this. Mm -hmm. But these things, like the Orville Dam, they just jump off the pages. Why, are we, why, why can't we as a society mobilize to, you know, at least fix a problem like this and then maybe look at all the other 8,000 dams across the country that we need to look at. What, what is wrong? Why can't we, you know, at least as far as our infrastructure, which we can see and we ride on every day, mm -hmm. why can't we do anything about that? Well, to me, it's just simple priorities. Um, things that, that benefit the common good, we don't, we don't yeah, really... Don't don't have time Not for until it's an emergency. Not until it's your dam. <laughs> it's your <laughs> yeah. in your house. Your or. car gets swallowed in the sinkhole on Main <laughs> then Street. Then it becomes right? a priority. Then right? it's a priority. <laughs> <laughs> so it really, it, it, it's just the short-term thinking over anything slightly longer term. Yes. Right? And, and that short-termism is so extreme now, it's really hard to get people involved in that longer term. And I think because it clutches them so tightly when you start talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, so I wrote an article a while back because I came across this article, completely changed everything, including the, the train ride I just took from, from Hartford down to DC. It was around concrete. 
And the idea is that we make concrete with something called rebar in it, and the rebar expands and contracts slightly differently. The sh summary is that if the concrete's poured near an ocean, it'll last about 40 years, otherwise maybe 100, which means that every single poured concrete structure within a 100-year cycle has to be replaced entirely. The amount of energy that's gonna take, the amount of money that's gonna take is not insignificant, it's enormous. And so when I took that train ride, all I saw was, it's called spalling when the concrete mm -hmm. finally gives way and you can see the rusty rebar underneath. Mm -hmm. And I, that's all I saw, it was just like a study in decay. And so I look at that and I cast forward and people are thinking, well, we won't have to replace that till 2030. And then I add up all the things that are landing on 2030, including an insolvent pension mm -hmm. system, entitlement programs that are bust, pension programs and municipalities that are upside down. Uh, the fact that we're gonna have to completely redo our energy infrastructure, all of these things are such huge costs that when the people give me that iPhone moment, I just, my heart sinks, because I'm like, you just don't understand the scale, the cost, the time involved in what's really coming down on us at this mm -hmm. point, right? Which is why, fast forward, a lot of young people I know have just checked out, of, including my own daughter. She's like, I don't, doesn't want to have a car, doesn't want to have, doesn't want anything to do with student debt, nothing. Good for her. She just said, uh, this doesn't make sense to her or any of her friends at this point. That's, that's really good, Dimitri. I think that what, what blocks discussion of that is the sheer scope of the problem and, and the fact that the numbers just don't add up. Um, a lot of stuff has been built uh, in a different era by uh, a different workforce with different financial arrangements. Um, and uh, the fact that it was built to last some number of years and that number has, has come around, and now we have people who can't do that work, uh, the material and then the industrial base that's pretty much gone, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the, the amount of money that would be taken to replace all of this stuff is outlandishly huge, kind of blocks that discussion. Yes, spalling is a problem. You know, concrete, oxygen gets in, uh, rebar gets oxidized, oxidized rebar is thicker than unoxidized rebar, and it blows up the concrete. And it's inevitable. Uh, you, can, you can do wonderful thing, things in, with cement that will last for thousands of years. But if you put metal reinforcement in there, it'll last maybe 50. So we're coming up against this kind of like scenario where just about everything that we rely on, the interstate system, the railroad bridges, everything is going to start failing faster and faster and faster. And, and all we can do really is shore it up and, and try to stop using it before. It can I say something about this? Yeah. We're also, we're, we, you, you can understand it perhaps this way too. Uh, we're seeing the collision between what I call the psychology of previous investment mm -hmm. and over investments in complexity with diminishing returns. Now those, those things sound very complicated or overly complicated, but, but um, Really what it means in, in the first case of uh, the psychology of previous investment is we put all of our national wealth into a certain set of furnishings and accessories for everyday life that we can't imagine letting go of them because that's where all our wealth is. We can't imagine even reforming them very much. A and as a practical matter, uh, I think you're correct. Uh, we're going to discover the money's not there. The mojo isn't there. But the other part of the problem is, is that we've, we've done this all in the service of erecting an overly complex system for daily life, and all of the refinements that we're now adding to it uh, are not helping it in any way. And the real project for this society is how are we going to downscale our activities and decomplexify them and relocalize them and make them uh, more coherent and understandable and more available to, to the broad population. And uh, that's the conversation we can't have because we, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck with the stuff that we have. And one other thing about the history, my new theory of history is not that it rhymes, uh, my, my new the theory of history is that things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time. You know? World okay. War I seemed mm -hmm. like a good idea at the time. <laughs> you know, they didn't realize that you know, 30, 50 million people were going to get killed yeah. in it. Um, suburbanizing America seemed like a really good idea at the time in 1952. Great idea. Not such a hot idea now that all of it is falling apart and we don't stand a chance of being able to replace the components of it. So uh, we got to get smaller finer, more local, and that's a conversation we can't have because it really means disassembling institutions and disassembling our customs and habits and practices and comforts and conveniences. We don't want to go there. 
But the money can be there. We, we're almost no, the talking. money's not going to be there. Forget about not, it. Not to, Forget not, about to, not to duplicate what we're doing, but I'm simply saying, when, when we're paying $650 billion for the fence, it's closer to a trillion if you have energy and everything else. And the tax rate that we have in this country, there is, there, there is money there. But the money is not being used for that because of political conscious choices. So I would argue that it seems to be there, but well, that's one of the problems we have with money right now. Is it what our concept of money and value and what it's in, what it's vested in, like bonds and stuff, mm -hmm. is purely notional currencies? You know, yeah, we have trillions and trillions of dollars. Really? I'm what talking, are those dollars? Talking, what are they really I'm amount to? I'm talking taxes. I'm talking. Mm -hmm. I'm talking taxes that we're not. Taxi. We're mm -hmm. the lowest tax. That's country. in the same basket of all that stuff. Uh, but is notional wealth that actually may not be there? But we're reserve currency. We're that that wealth that we have that the Fed yeah, prints get, gets turns into. Well, mm -hmm. I think you know yeah. gets turned in can be turned into things that can make those things happen. Yeah. Right. That's and, the and difference. I, and right. today I can sell my house for three hundred and seventeen thousand dollars, but maybe in two years, you know, nobody will pay one hundred and fifty grand for it. That's possible. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. Money, the whole, f the, the focus on money is very useful, and of course you're making a very good point that we, we decide as a society that it's a certain people have a, uh, have a very, out, uh, an outlandish role in making those decisions. We decide as a society where the money we have is going to go. But money is just a, a system of tokens. True. It's a way of... It's a way of managing the distribution of actual goods and actual services, or of maldistributing. So yeah, would actually, you say there's a difference between money and wealth? There has to be. Of until, until you recognize yes. that, you're flying blind in a fog. Mm -hmm. Because we have a lot more money in the United States these days than we have wealth. And we, there's a lot of stuff that is supposedly worth a lot of money that actually isn't worth much wealth at all. And we have built up this immense structure of, of notional paper value. Um, could some of that be redirected in ways that um, could help the transition? Yes, for as long as that, as that holds out. But at some point, that's one of the things that we learn from history is that that kind of overinflated, teetering to financial tower of Babel does not last indefinitely. When it comes down and we actually have to deal with how much wealth you actually have less, left, it can be really tight. And so I think, I think both of you are speaking to yeah. realities here. Yes. I think both of you, and you know, while, while the money is available, we, while the money exists, while our current financial system more or less functions, more or less, yes, there's a lot of things we could do about it. But we need to be aware that it's, there, it's, a, it's a pyramid stood on its point. And that you know, the, the actual basis underneath this immense conglomeration of, of fictive wealth um, may not be able to support much. But uh, so much of what we call the, the, it's great, great discussion, separating money from actual wealth. Mm -hmm. So money isn't wealth, it's a claim on wealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wealth is the food I can buy with it, is the house I can buy with it, it's stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The amount of fictitious currency, paper units, debt, mm -hmm. derivatives, mm -hmm. things like that, yes. those are all predicated on one idea, that the future is going to be bigger than the present. Yes. We're, 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 we've been compounding debt at twice the rate of yes. GDP, for 35 years. Yes. It's a bad idea. It broke in 2008, and rather than recognize mm -hmm. that, we said, we nah, one more spin of the wheel. Print them all money. Let's, print, yeah. let's keep going. Mm -hmm. And so now Quantitative we have easy, right? more <laughs> debt and more, yeah. and all these people mm -hmm. allegedly got wealthy off of this, the, the 0.1%, mm -hmm. all of that. But that whole story comes breaking down if, if people get this one idea, if, if this becomes popular. This is the most dangerous idea I know. Infinite exponential growth is impossible on a finite planet, mm -hmm. period. As Kenneth Boulding used to say, the only people who can believe in infinite growth on a finite planet are madmen and economists. <laughs> <laughs> but once you internalize the idea, like this can't grow forever, yeah. then you say, well, what are all these stocks and bonds worth? Because they're predicated on growth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amazon, great company. It's worth $450 billion market cap, but it's got a price earnings ratio of 197 right yes. now. That means <laughs> you put a dollar in, yes. you need 197 years yes. to get it back. Mm. That's a long time. What could happen in 197 <laughs> years? Something? I don't know what. Right? Well, yeah. you've got, you've got a, 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 I think, a pretty good understanding of uh, wealth and value in, in your system of uh, the declension of capital, mm -hmm. of different forms of capital. And, and um, I'd be interested in how that, you saw that applied to this. 
Well, it's so like social capital. Yeah. So. Now, now everything I've I've been talking about up to this point is sort of problem definition, which is half my work. The other half is solution space. So about now, hopefully, you're thinking, well, what do we do about this? Because I don't think defining the problem any further helps, helps at this yeah. stage. Talk, I, think, uh, I think we know what we're talking about, yeah. what we're dealing yeah, with. Let's, right. Let's go there. Um, so let's go there. Uh, you know, we came across Adam Taggart and myself. He's the other co-founder of Peak Prosperity. We came across this work by a couple of permaculturalists who talked about eight forms of capital, and they were trying to map how the natural world works into the human space, mm -hmm. particularly around wealth. And so they came up with eight forms of capital. And so financial capital we're all familiar with. That's one. But what about our social capital? It has value, but maybe we can't put a dollar price on it. Or mm -hmm. our knowledge capital, knowledge what capital. we know and, and, and all that. It has real value, too. Mm -hmm. uh, material capital, certainly I do a lot of stuff. People say, oh, they want to prepare for the future, and they're always in the material capital. Mm -hmm. like, how many generators do I need? <laughs> you know, stuff like that, right? How many, how many tins of beef stew? Yes. How many tins of beef stew? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. how many do you currently eat? None? Then you need none. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's a couple of others that fit in there. Um, time capital is very important, but also uh, emotional capital is the one I focus on most now. And it really comes from a, a story uh, from the former USSR when it breaks apart in 1989, um, uh, roughly up through 1997, about 54% of all deaths recorded in Russia were due to alcohol. And Part of the story around that is, well, uh, Russia's a hard-drinking nation to begin with, but in a normal country, that's 4%, not 54. So what happened? Well, it turned out people, mostly middle-aged men, who used to have a job, lost their job, and their whole sense of identity went away, and so they drank. Right? And it turns out that that was actually, whether we like how it happened or not, one of the most explosive periods of new capital formation in Russian history. So for the people who could navigate into that new territory, emotionally were resilient, given the changes that were coming, they stepped into it and lived it. Other people checked out and died. Now, this is a dark subject, but in 2010, in America, suicides overtook car accidents as the leading non-natural cause, cause of death. Of death yeah. It's 2010. This is an allegedly one of the number one foam finger, you know, we're the best countries with, <laughs> where mm -hmm. things are still relatively easy. And so in this story, I think if you're really wealthy and you've got tins of beef stew and you've got everything else, but you fall to pieces when the world changes, mm -hmm. you've got nothing. So emotional capital, a really important form. And so what we do is, is we talk across all eight forms of capital and how if you build all of those up, and by the way, five of them take no money and money doesn't help, mm -hmm. right? So, so for people like, oh, I don't have money, I can't be resilient, like, nope, not true. <laughs> Let's make sure we touch on all eight before we end here today. Mm -hmm. uh, Dimitri? You were. Um, since I know something about the USSR, I'll talk about that. The capital formation in the 90s that you talk about in the early 90s was actually financialization of a previously unfinancial, un, un, unfinancialized set of public assets that were privatized, you could say, but actually stolen by mm -hmm. a bunch of mm -hmm. oligarchs, oligarchs connected, yeah. connected to the Yeltsin administration, which was the most corrupt in all of Russian history. That's and, impressive. And, um, <laughs> yes. And that's saying something? Yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing is that the entire capital base of, of the Soviet Union was, was built without recourse to money because Soviet central planners didn't think in terms of rubles or dollars. They, they, they thought in terms of gigawatts, in terms of millions of tons of steel and cement. Uh, what was on the news was not how the financial markets are doing, which was ephemeral, and that's what people pay attention to here, but you know, how many millions of tons of wheat were produced, what the harvest is like. It was a physical economy. It was not this kind of mental financialized economy. Mm -hmm. And what happened was it, it got transformed into a financialized economy in a haphazard way in the 90s. But look at what the Soviets built. You know, Ukraine was pretty much you know, the land that time forgot ever since independence. All that the, the Ukrainian leadership has been doing over the past 35 years is looting the place mm -hmm. and exporting everything, and including you know, money in their bank accounts. Um, and still, t until fairly recently, uh, Ukraine had a lot of industrial capacity. They still have uh, 15 uh, uh, nuclear reactors that, that are now generating uh, a lot, like 40% of all the electricity in the country. Um, they, they still have uh, all of this industry that, that they didn't manage to destroy. And that be that's because when the Soviet planners looked at it, they didn't look at money. They looked at actual capacity. They, they looked at the value of it, not in terms of money, but in terms of what it produced. And the results were very good. They, they produced a lot of very sturdy stuff. 
So money, to sum it up, is just a, an imperfect way to measure things. It's not a prime mover. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the physical economy, not the financial economy, or you'll never figure out what's going on. You'll be like Janet Yellen, you know, looking at tea leaves. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, if, you know, someone like myself, who in 2006 got out of the markets, but understanding the physical market stayed out of them, I lost a huge windfall between that point and now. So can, what advice would you have for someone who's looking, like all of us, I think, look at what's going on in the physical plane mm -hmm. and trying to, we, trying to right square what's going on in the financial markets and all mm -hmm. these ethereal uh, places, mm -hmm. and we, we just keep, see, we seem to, at least personally, we seem to keep hitting a wall. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not accidental. The problem is we live in a declining society, and that means that setting aside the machinations of money, okay, in effect, every business is going to lose a little value. Every investment is going to lose a little value every year. Now, we can cover that over by playing games with interest rates, but the fact that interest rates have had to drop as far as they have, I mean, yes, that's manipulative. Yes, there's a lot of corruption going on, but the fact is, if an ex if in, when an economy is expanding, on the, av the average investment, the average business gains year over year. When an economy is contracting, the average business loses year over year. Okay? And I'd like to suggest that we are far closer to the latter than the former at this point. That in fact, as long as we are looking at making money, making wealth, becoming richer than we were, um, we're taking a very long walk up a very short pier because all of our expectations of economic growth, of betterment, of improvement, all this stuff that's hardwired into our imaginations, that was relevant to a period of time that's actually passed. Yes. And we're now facing a situation where um, we have to face, those of us who are relatively privileged, relatively well off, are gonna have to face the most difficult task we've ever faced, which is learning how to be poor with some level of dignity. Hmm. Now, that's terrifying for a lot of white people. Okay? Most people of color know how to be poor. They've had plenty of practice, as you pointed out earlier. Most of us, we have no clue. We're terrified of being poor. We've never done it. And the thought of rubbing elbows with somebody who's poor will make a lot of people in the salary classes wet themselves. Yeah. Okay. Car so, couch surfing is character building. Yeah, you know, <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a writer by trade. Like, every, like almost every other writer, we'll leave you know, some, of the, some few out. I spent a long time making very, very little money. And so I, got, I had the chance to experience poverty, a, a pretty fair level of poverty, and um, I'm not well off yet, nor do I ever expect to be. And I watch people who are coming to the whole issue of how we're going to deal with the decline of American society, with the economic contraction of our times, with the assumption that, of course, they're going to be fine. They're going to keep the nice house. They're going to have a car to drive. They're going to have the, all this expensive health care. Um, there's a memo on its way, and I don't think you're going to like what it says. And so the question is, are you willing to learn how to be poor with some level of dignity and skill? And it takes skill. You have to learn how to do it if you haven't done that. Are you willing to do that, or are you willing to just wait until the bottom drops out? And you end up, like so many people in, in, the, late, in the, the formerly Soviet former Union, um, but there are choices, though. The, there are choices yeah. in Scandinavian countries that mm -hmm. we can have minimal incomes. There are, I mean, it there, isn't just plain poverty is the choice. No. There are collective there, choices. There, that, there are things that could be done. Are we doing them? No, that's a different story. <laughs> and you see, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no debate yeah, there. We're, well. so, <laughs> we're doing an uh, intermission at this point. Okay. And so we're going to take a 10 minute intermission, check what's coming through the feeds and everything. <laughs> And, uh, but I think this is a great place to stop because it's so, um, someone had mentioned earlier, you know, we, we've been talking about what the problems are. Let's look at some, you know, solutions if, they are so, if there are solutions. Let's just say course correction. I, I see I'm going to have to talk about the difference between a problem and a predicament. There we are. Yeah, that's actually <laughs> great. We'll definitely touch that in the uh, hour coming up. But I uh, want to again thank our audience here and our audience uh, on YouTube. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Lin. I'm one of the co-founders of <coughs> Center for Progressive Urban Politics, and we are at our summit uh, to talk about uh, 
Well, I guess in a way we're, we're talking about um, uh, sustainability. We're talking about our current predicament. And, uh, and the, the last, uh, in the last hour, we really talked about really what kind of predicament we're in. What are the issues? What, what are the, the things we're dealing with? And I was hoping in this last hour we could continue with that, but also, like Chris, you had mentioned some of those, some of the forms of capital, and five of which re, which require no money, things that are going to be very useful in uh, in the coming years to us. Uh, so to get that, uh, uh, I guess, uh, to get that uh, line of questions started, uh, I'd like to revisit the forms of capital, Chris. <clears throat> Uh, in particular, the kinds of capital that don't require any money, any financial wealth. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I mentioned six. The, the, there are eight. The remaining two would have been cultural and living. So living capital is everything which sustains us. It includes my body. It includes uh, the ecosystem around me. So in my own house, if you came over to visit, you would see um, I live in a suburban uh, little, little uh, cape in a small town in Massachusetts. I've got about two acres, and I've got bees, I have an orchard, I've got a garden. This is what I choose to do with my time. I love doing this. But I'm planting not for food for myself, I'm planting for abundance in general. I'm not a gardener, I am a soil uh, developer, right? So I, I, everything's about increasing soil wealth and health, and my, my appreciation for nature is this. <coughs> I don't have to be smart. It's already plenty smart. I just have to not get in its way and, and understand how I can uh, be part of that process. And one of the most important, this is really important that, that came to me, which was, um, you know, uh, Jim, you said once, you know that when the bulldozers show up across the street, something ugly is about to happen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the guys in the yellow hats. The yellow hat, right? It's over, right? It's just, that's, mm -hmm. it's bad. And um, encoded in that is a story I actually internalized for a long time, which is that humans ruin stuff. And that got encoded so deeply that I got kind of depressed about that as an idea, like, oh, you know, this is just going to get ugly. Permaculture and that whole movement teaches us that humans can be imp incredible agents for positive change. Nature can build topsoil, say, an inch 100 years. We can do it in a year, right? We can use our intelligence to interact with nature in a way that can actually really increase the abundance, but we have to decide that's what we're going to do. But I love the narrative shift, which is I can now be an agent for regeneration, not extraction. Such an important thing to have that as my encoded philosophy. And so that took a little undoing, but my whole yard now is about living capital and building that. And I do that because, well, there could be some awkward future scenarios where it's important to have a garden, but I do it mostly because I need to be connected now with this idea that I'm living in an accordance where my ideas and my actions are now aligned. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to me. Um, and so living capital gives you a chance to do that. If you had a picture of me from six years ago, I have a lot more weight on me. Um, I'm a lot unhappier looking kind of a guy. I actually looked older than how old? You, first time you met me, you thought I was, anyway. We were going there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you had advanced premature Jewish old man disease. <laughs> That's an acronym. I try. I can't work it out. But um, so, uh, so can we get there? Going down the the uh, the, the, the the corridors of a of a uh, supermarket, aisle, going down supermarket aisles and picking up our food there. Do we have to make those kind can. of changes? Uh, no. It, the way you have to deal with the supermarket, though, is you just understand everything <coughs> in the interior aisles is off limits. You just have to shop around the edge, because um, everything in the middle is now I understand is toxic food. So my own personal journey. The reason I lost a lot of weight wasn't deprivation, exercise, and you know all of that. It was cutting out the foods in my life that were inflaming my body. We have inflammatory food systems here, sugars, processed things. I had my own uh, blood draw and, and got a, a, a food sensitivity analysis, circulating antibodies, my own little fingerprint, really weird. Almonds I was inflamed by, but not pecans or walnuts. You know, so. I got my own little food fingerprint, but it basically said stay away from processed foods. I did that. Within six months, I felt great. My joints were no longer hurting. I thought I had old man disease. That's partly true, but not entirely. Uh, I was really being inflamed by the food I was eating, and I live in a house where we, we were eating pretty carefully. So uh, this was a big journey for me and something I realized, which is that our food is a racket. Was I was actually just going to ask, is our food a racket? Mm -hmm. 
or the whole food system. Mm. Yeah, well, um, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about systems because we've got a, a giant system that we're living in, which is a, a system of other systems. And they're all going to have to be fixed. You know, the, and you can state what they are with some precision. They are the agriculture, industrial agriculture. We're not going to be able to do that anymore. The way we do commerce and big box stores and 12,000 mile supply lines, we're done with that. that that's not going to work anymore. Uh, the, the racket that has become medicine, forget about that. That's not working anymore. Um, the way we do schooling, you know, the big giant universities are going to either get smaller uh, or disappear entirely. Um, the way we do the uh, centralized high schools, that's going to have to change. Um, so virtually all the systems that we depend on for everyday life. And uh, it's a huge task to, to uh, reform and change all these things. The catch is, it's probably not going to be uh, you know, a top-down kind of thing. Uh, I was talking in the audience uh, just, before the, or just before we came back from the break. Societies are essentially emergent phenomena. And that means that they self-organize in response to the circumstances that present themselves at a particular time and place. So uh, these circumstances are now presenting themselves. It's liable to be a little bit harsh, uh, but uh, we are going to respond. And we're going to respond by reorganizing these activities. The trouble is, we can't really predict how disorderly this process is going to be. And it's probably going to be kind of disorderly, maybe a little mm -hmm. harsh and painful. Mm -hmm. And that's just the unhappy truth of it. And uh, it's, it's always, because we, we talk about collapse here. We've been talking about it for the last hour. Uh, I mean, how will that manifest? Uh, what will it look like to the person on the street? I, I would like to get everyone's may, input. May, may, may that. I address that one? Sure. Um, look out the window. It's already happening. Historically speaking, collapse is not something that is an overnight process. It doesn't, I mean, people in, people in ancient Rome didn't um, suddenly open the door one morning and look out and good heavens, we're in the dark ages now. Okay. It's a process. And it's a process that's been underway in, in this country and, and others for a very long time. When you look out and you notice that the streets are going to bits. When you notice that um, the educational system no longer educates. An increasing number of people are just keeping their kids at home and teaching them there, or just not teaching them at all. When the medical system um, is, becomes far more fixated on making profits than on um, curing, I mean, you don't even talk about curing diseases now. It's managing conditions, because of course that's more profitable. Um, and to the point that um, total visits to, doc to, to MDs have dropped below total visits to alternative practitioners. Whatever you think about you know, homeopathic sugar pills or not, you, no one ever went broke and lost their home buying homeopathic medicines. And so this is what collapse looks like. We're in it. We're in a fairly early stage, well, an early middle stage of it. Um, we can expect to see a lot more of it. We can expect, but it's not going to be the kind of thing that so many people imagine collapse as this Boom, Hollywood spectacular, corpses scattered like a really bad George Romero movie. Um, you know, so we're not going to have a clear line of demarcation. There never is. There never is. Um, Pete, long after the Roman Empire was pushing up daisies, people still went through the fiction that the Roman Empire was still thriving. And well, these are temporary problems. We'll get over them. Similarly, I expect 200 years from now, when the president of the United States is a tribal warlord, Everyone will still use the same verbiage and rhetoric. You know, even, even you know, when 90% of the American population is subsistence farmers. Sitting and, around their campfires. Sitting around their campfires or, you know, or, or, or huddled in, in one room hovels. Okay? Everyone will still, be, will still be talking as though nothing really important has changed and it's just, you know, it's just temporary conditions. Draw. Oh, go ahead. Chris, go ahead. Um, so on that point, though, uh, a psychological phenomenon is that whenever we experience um, a sh this kind of downsizing you're talking about, it gets associated with the word loss, and our <coughs> amygdala in our brain goes, oh, that's death. <laughs> like, it's just it gets, it's this really strange emotional process of we just want to avoid that. Mm -hmm. We don't like the word down, because lying down, you're sick. You know, you're looking sideways at the world. We want to be upright. Um, I, I get all of that, but I'm here as somebody who was vice president of a Fortune 300 company, got hands around this sort of story we've been talking about, wrestled with it for a while, and yeah, we pulled our kids out of school. So what happened as a consequence of me getting a hold of this information? 
I had a five bedroom house in Mystic, Connecticut. I had a Grady White Gulfstream with a couple engines on it at a slope, slip a mile away. That's the before story. Afterwards, um, I have a kayak with a twin paddle now. Um, our kids were homeschooled starting then, uh, changed where we lived, uh, downsized extraordinarily. And if you cut through it all, what happened was we cut our standard of living in half and our quality of life doubled. I was running from something at the time, but I would run towards something knowing what I know now, mm -hmm. which is this is a better life I've got now. Better relationships, I'm healthier, mm -hmm. I, I can sleep well at night, I love the... You know where fear lives in this culture? It lives between the gap between what you know and what you're doing about it. Nice. You can't unknow what, you've, what you know, so you have to... The only way I know to close that gap is make your actions come into alignment with what you know. It's that easy, it's that hard. But so for me, you know, again, yeah, this is all sort of terrifying stuff, but I'm happier. I'm mm -hmm. much more, you know, anything now, my, my litmus test is I'll do something if it makes me feel more connected mm -hmm. and more alive. Keep in mind that you started out with a lot more resources than many, many, many other people. True, and somebody who was working for me as a single mother, recently divorced, four children, homeschooling, mm -hmm. earning just part-time wages from me, and, and she managed to do everything in terms of getting resilient that I've just talked about, mm -hmm. but she tapped into that great flowing river of stuff that is America mm -hmm. through free cycle Craigslist, took, took more time. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, again, this, you know, it, mm. there are advantages that, that help from position, but it's not a requirement in this okay. story. I just want to, no. because some oh, people use, throw it up like, oh, no, I can't do that because no, I don't no, have I'm don't not have saying resources. that. It's just, it, it can be very difficult for people. It can be extremely difficult. I know people who've, who've had It's mostly emotionally that. difficult, I've not discovered. Not necessarily. It, it, can be, it can be difficult, but I think it's a very important point that, you know, we're, we're sitting here and um, we're critiquing and we're maybe offering advice, but another thing that uh, I think all of us to one extent or another can offer is an example. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I think it's a valid point that you need some resources to get started. You can't do anything without any resources. You can't even buy a bus to take it out of town. Um, but. Ten years ago, I, I gave up the house and the car and the job, moved on to a sailboat with, with my wife, and we've been living aboard for ten years ever since, bringing up a family. Uh, and uh, basically, our, our, our needs, our, our need, need for money, for having a job, for any of that, uh, pretty much went away, uh, allowing me to write books and, and uh, run a blog and do various other things. Um, my, my, wife, my life got a lot better as a result of that, so I, I basically have the same experience. You know, when I was working a corporate job, I didn't have the option of, uh, you know, cooking three meals a day for my family from scratch. Now I do. I, I, have, I have that luxury, and that's a luxury that a lot of people don't have. Um, there, are, there are other people that I know that I've been working with that, that also can serve up as an example. Um, one fellow, Greg Jeffers, uh, just published his book, Prosperous Homesteading, um, he he uh, is living in Kentucky. He used to work for Bear Stearns. Now he's living in Kentucky uh, on some number of acres, I think uh, 20, 30 acres at this point. And, and he's worked out a system with the help of his Amish neighbors that basically allows the land to provide just about everything that the family needs. So they, they don't go shopping anymore. They don't, ha they don't have insurance anymore. They don't use a car anymore. They, they've basically embraced this lifestyle. And if you look at them and their kids and you know, their, their entire setup, they're probably the happiest people you know. They, they shoot YouTube videos and you know, they, they, it looks like a wonderful, wonderful life. So you know, that's another example of what you can do. Um, and and uh, the mindset that's required, and that, that's something they also got from, from the Amish is, well, if. This, this is something that I think applies to just about everyone. We're, we bring up families and then we kind of send our kids into, out into the world and expect them to thrive, uh, or at least not fail. But, but the economic scheme that we're pushing them out into is basically a game of musical chairs. And um, it's, it's really unfair. Um, so we could do much better than that by actually, in our time, productive years, come up with a scheme that gives a role to our children, gives them something, a stake, uh, a livelihood uh, within the family. Mm. Uh, so that's something that a lot of people can pursue. Uh, mm. Instead of just working a job and then expecting society to take care of their kids, they can take the matter into their own hands. Mm -hmm. There's so many public policy choices that we're not making. 
that could greatly influence them. I agree about, of course, exponential sustainability is impossible, but there are choices that go much less than that. Not, and that don't require great huge changes in terms of policy choices. Uh, I, I mentioned the one uh, that we move away from empire and our one trillion support. And that's really what we're talking about. We, Energy Department and mm -hmm. the CIA and all the ones, that, and NSA and all the ones that are not on the budget. That's a, that, that can influence uh, in, in ways of health. The other thing I, I think that of why, if there's any optimistic mode, is the thing that we're learning about ourselves from knowledge about incentives, about healthy lifestyles, incentives of, of, about uh, food, incentives about, and, and that's even without an F, effective FDA that does adequate testing. I mean, our drug policy, so crazy, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, which is just, uh, if we don't, we really shouldn't have drugs. I mean, <laughs> our reliance on that is just terrible. So, I mean, there, 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 there's just many things about lifestyles that we as, as, mm -hmm. as, as human beings, as Americans, as, as have the capacity that we're beginning to learn because we have access to information that I think is going to really influence uh, this. So that's why I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not as sure that the decline, it will be a decline, but mm -hmm. it's going to be so painful or it has to be so painful if different public policy choices were made. And they could be made once we begin to see that it's just not a few people that are going to be suffering, but that many are are, are, could, could, could make the change better for all by a, a, a greater sense of social cohesion, a greater sense of, of the commons, of recognition. There's going to be a lot of economic activity that could be done by, by, by some of these changes. There, there are many different choices mm -hmm. that we as a country have not made that we could make, which uh, could greatly influence this. And I, and I think, and it's going to be done over a long period of time. So whether we'll make those choices, if, mm -hmm. of course, if I knew that, I could. <laughs> I don't see where the, I don't get where you think that great groaning colossus of the uh, gigantic central government is going to be there to do all this. Because uh, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that one of the symptoms or expressions of our times that we're seeing is that the central government is becoming more incompetent, more feckless, uh, more incapacitated, and, and pretty soon it's going to be, uh, you know, well, it's going well, to start shrinking. When you, when, you have, when you have parties, when you have had presidents that have been run against government for, for years, and when you have, we're the only country in the world that assumes that it's the, the central government is so, so incompetent, government per se that is incompetent, but an unregulated private sector works in the public interest. We're the only no, but you're acting as though there's going to be a choice about it. What I'm saying is I don't think there's going to be a choice. I think we're not going to be able to uh, uh, finance that sort of uh, government activity, and that government is going to get smaller. Uh, I don't know how small it's going to get, but it's going to get a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I wouldn't it's make only, any plans based it's on the not expectation only a question of being that small, we're going to have all these policies. It's been effective. It's been smaller mm -hmm. and effective. Well, and we've got a long way that we could do that. I'm not sure that. we could do either of those. I'd like to, well, I'd like to, I'd like to suggest that, again, we, ha we have more than one kind of government in this country. And there's a huge amount that can be done at the local level as... Na the na as the national, the na the, I, I, would, I would say that the, one of the things that makes the national government so, so feckless at this point is its fixation on a failed model of imperial profiteering. Okay. The, the trillion dollars you were talking about, you know, and, and a vast amount more, is all focused on a vision of the United States as the, the hyperpower dominating the planet, and the by the way, mm -hmm. maintaining the a state of affairs where the 5% of us in this country get um, a, a quarter of the world's energy, a third of its raw materials, and a third of its manufactured product. That does not happen because, because, we're, because everyone in the world thinks we're so nice, they just send it to us, remember. Um, it happens because we've got troops garrisoned in more than 100 countries around the mm -hmm. world. It happens because we have an empire. So as that comes apart, and it is coming apart yes. now, of course, um, all of us are going to take the equivalent of a very, very large pay cut. All of that is going to render the national government, if we can maintain a national government, I, I, I'm by no means sanguine that the United States will continue as a, as a single nation at this point. But whatever kind of national government will remain left is going to be a lot smaller by definition simply because the resources to maintain the kind of extravagance we now see are simply not going to be there. But what can be done at the local government level, what can be done at the state government level, sure. that is, first of all, that's where any effective movement has to begin, by taking, to, taking charge of things at the lowest level. Back when politics were more or less worked in this country, 
it w a lot of it was on the base, started from the local level and worked upwards. You start but from the grassroots. Before we start right. anywhere, we've got to have uh -huh. a constitutional amendment that says that corporations mm -hmm. are not people and that money is not speech. But you won't get, yes, but you won't get that until you've done a lot of work to force it down the throats of a corporate Amen. society. So we You're can't start right. there. We can't start there. We have to start with a lot of hard work at the grassroots level, right, right here in Lancaster and wherever else you happen to be. That's where the rubber meets the road. It's, as a political movement gets its traction there, it can actually make some change and work up. So, you know, interestingly enough, what I learned about the Amish community mm -hmm. was that if someone in their community was needing, let's say a mm -hmm. spouse died, there was <clears throat> assistance that was needed, and that person was living in want, that mm -hmm. would be an embarrassment to the community that mm -hmm. they could not provide for their community. And so that's really a very, a, mm -hmm. an example of very grassroots. And things that I think get in the way of that, you know, Dimitri, in your book, you talk about the Iron Triangle. Mm -hmm. And how, if you want to explain that and how that kind of keeps us from really just it keeps us really enslaved to this corporatocracy. Well, yes. Uh, one of the biggest swindles in, in, in the U.S. is housing. Um, it's ridiculously overpriced, and at the same time, uh, millions of, uh, of houses and apartments stand empty. Uh, it's, it's an artificially manipulated market. Um, and, and a lot of families spend up to half of their income uh, just for, on a place to live. Um, and if you look at what the houses are actually like, there are these shoddy little boxes, mm -hmm. ticky-tacky, you know? <laughs> I sticks, remember a song about that. <laughs> sticks nailed together. Um, they're, they're quite ridiculous. You know, by Russian standards, if a house can't take, you know, a mortar hit and survive, <laughs> it's not a house. <laughs> a direct mortar hit. Um, so the walls are about this thick. And, um, it's, it's done that way for all sorts of reasons. Um, one of them is you don't have to worry about maintenance for about two, three hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, but here you have these ridiculously overpriced little boxes that people have to pay all kinds of money to. And of course these boxes are stuck in places that are nowhere near anything that you need. You can't shop there, you can't work there, you can't farm there. You, you can just sit there in a box next to a bunch of other boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you have to pay for it. So then you need a car to get you out of this trap, to get you someplace where you can actually work and shop, et cetera. So that gets you driving around, burning gasoline. That's important. It, it's your job to burn gasoline. Um, <laughs> keeps the petroleum industry functioning. Um, and, and so you're driving between this box where you live, this box where you work, and this box where you shop. And that's the, the iron triangle. And, and you can't escape because as soon as you remove one corner of the triangle, the others collapse. You lose your job. You can't make your car payments or your, your mortgage payments, and, and you lose everything. You lose the car. You can't escape. You're trapped in a box. You lose the box. What are you going to do? Live in your car? And you know some people do that, sleep in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and you know, show up Homeless. for work. Yeah. But not too many people thrive doing that. Uh, and in a lot of places, even that is made difficult. There, there's one Google employee who's doing it. Um, but he's, he's got a, an actual truck set up in, in, in the company parking lot, you know, with a bed and all kinds of stuff. So well, it's possible, but it's very difficult. So that's the Iron Triangle. I broke out of the Iron Triangle by getting rid of all of it and just getting a sailboat. And I have a sailboat and a bicycle. Uh, there's no hope of getting a, you know, a car onto a sailboat, so cars are not <laughs> And, you know, jobs, you know, require you to keep a schedule, and, and that precludes sailing because you don't know when the wind is going to be good. Um, mm -hmm. So no job and no car. And why would I have a house if, if I have a sailboat that I live on? So that, that was my escape. Um, here's another example. If you want to get into, say, growing all your own food so you don't have to, you know, go shopping, you don't need money for that, um, capture your own water, um, and, and just live off the land, well, you'll need a barn, right? But then where do you live? Answer, you, you frame up an apartment inside the barn and you live there. And that's actually a perfectly viable plan. And, and uh, my friend uh, Greg Livestock actually Livestock will keep that. you warm in the winter? Yeah, <laughs> eventually he, he built a house, you know, a humble house uh, for his family because uh, his family got bigger. So now the, the, the barn apartment is, is a guest house. 
And you'd be amazed how many people go and work for free for him just to learn his farming techniques and live in the guest house. So there, there are ways to escape. That's just two examples, but there are ways to escape. There are ways to break out of the iron triangle. Well, I think all of us, I, frankly, the only exception, we've all departed the major metro areas to smaller towns and villes as part of that, uh, I think, process. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me just say, I might be the other exception, too, on recognizing that the critical role that government can play, because it hasn't played the role it's played, because it has played the role it's played, we don't recognize the role it could play. Mm -hmm. For instance, the overwhelming amount of college debt. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why young people haven't asked for Jubilee. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that just as the money was printed out, the printing machine could pay off quantitative easing, they could pay off that college debt that students have. And yeah. also, the, the fact that, you know, uh, I'm old enough to have a defined benefit pension, you know. People, especially young people, have been hustled out of the belief that uh, the, the contributory pension, the 401s, are somehow that they're all going to become Bill Gates or have sustainability or choices of leisure when they get old. Now, these are public policy choices that we haven't made or we've unmade mm -hmm. that could greatly impact, uh, mm -hmm. you know. I went to some of the greatest schools in the world with fellowships and scholarships. Now they've turned them into loans and so mm -hmm. forth. Just, just public policy mm -hmm. decisions. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm thinking we're talking survival for everyone. Then we've got to recognize that certain mm -hmm. public policy choices can make a great deal of difference in the way that that e evolution is to well, a change of status. Well, for the college status. loans uh, specifically, what we did with the college loans was we started bundling them into bonds the same way we did with mortgages. So now. The college loans are entailed in, in daisy chains of obligations that, that mm -hmm. uh, you know, could crack up the financial system if you stopped the, the uh, if you had a jubilee. But I think that a, a debt jubilee could happen in another way. It, it would be the Twitter version, which is one day a message goes out on Twitter that just says, all you millennials out there, Next Thursday, Stop let's stop paying, paying our college loans. <laughs> amen. <laughs> I thought yeah. at the magic moment. Yes, mm -hmm. amen. It's I, a real possibility. Whatever way it's done. Yeah. So, uh, on that note, uh, Jim, you, you were talking about rackets earlier, and you just mentioned this. Yeah, that's so a racket, would, by the way, right. bundling mm -hmm. the, the college loans. Oh, sure you would is. think the, the anger would be rising up and the pitchforks would be out. Why, why, why isn't that happening? Why aren't we mm -hmm. getting a revolution in the street over things like this, where people are Definitely being uh, mm -hmm. because it hasn't happened. That's the kind of thing that can happen very suddenly. That's mm -hmm. that you know that gets back to you know well what what you were saying about catabolic collapse. That mm -hmm. you know it's like the old Hemingway line. You know how did you go broke? Uh, well, very slowly and then all at once. <laughs> because yeah. we're dealing with we're dealing with uh, complex nonlinear complex mm -hmm. systems, mm -hmm. which uh, tend to produce what's called phase change, mm -hmm. which means rather sudden mm -hmm. changes in the stability of the system. Absolutely. So just because that hasn't happened yet, I I, yeah. I wouldn't say you know People. just because the kids haven't uh, gotten pissed off and and started mm -hmm. throwing bombs around, uh, it's yeah. not out of the question at all. Enough people have to re have to reach the point that they reach the screw it moment where for them the cost of not the, the cost of not doing anything outweighs the cost of potentially being killed okay, okay. and we we're not there yet we we have come very close in a couple of ways and not necessarily in ways that um, progressives would like again we were talking earlier about the situation in flyover country um, that you know, we can't, at several points, we've come very close to the possibility of domestic insurgency because there are so many people who have been driven to the wall. They have no hope left, but they have plenty of guns. And, it, you know, when you reach the point where the, you have, as Lao Tzu says, you know, in, in the Tao Te Ching, it's no use threatening people with death if they have nothing to hope for from life. And you're talking people on both sides of the spectrum, the left it's, and the right. We're getting there. Yeah. And so, yeah, we could be moving toward an explosion. Now, it's all very well and good to think, oh, wouldn't that be great? We would, you know, get rid of the student loans. But that's a really, really dangerous place to go. Because once you start getting into domestic insurgency, you start getting the risk of civil war, 
Um, the most likely outcomes of that are either um, pr prolonged chaos and a lot of deaths or dictatorship. How's that for a fun choice? <laughs> um, let's not go there. We don't have to go there. Um, there are policy steps that can be taken to prevent that if they're taken in time, if the people in the bubble realize that their heads could be the ones on, you know, stuck up on pitchforks. You know, there's a lot of lamp posts in New York City. And I'm afraid you know, too many people have not realized that lamp posts have uses other than illumination. <laughs> but it's all, but just one more thing. The policy choices, policy choices that were possible in an expanding economy may no longer be possible in a contracting one. Um, a lot of our ideas of pensions, for example, are based on the experience of America, when America had an expanding economy, when we could expect more wealth, forget about money again, more wealth every year than the year before. As we move out of that, we're gonna have some very hard choices to make because it's going to be much less easy to devote a very large share of the nation's wealth to the care of, say, retirees. And so there, there's a lot of very hard choices that have to be made. Yes, public policy can do a lot, but it's important to look at the realities of our situation and just, just basically how, d how deep we have dug ourselves at this point. And, and I see um, retirement as basically, under one view, it could be seen as a, a two, maybe three generation long artifact of oil. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it never happens. In, you know, prior to 1930, retirement, like uh, spending my life on Acapulco just because I hit a certain age. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it's a bizarre notion. Yeah, nobody it takes surplus energy to pull that off. Yeah. Forget all the machinations, policy, this, that, what money means, what it doesn't mean. Without mm -hmm. surplus energy, you don't retire. You, mm -hmm. you keep working, right? Mm -hmm. so, but it was poverty before then, too, in the 30s that uh, why they brought about the change, the depression well, and the... And the uh, yeah, but I'm, I have a totally different lens on this, Frank, which, okay. is, which is looking at this just from an energy standpoint. Mm -hmm. All the rest is, is kind of details. With surplus energy, you can do stuff. So like if you're on a mountain, if you're a mountaineer and you're eating surplus calories, you probably can make it to the top and back down again. As soon as you go into deficit, a lot less becomes possible mm -hmm. and, and it becomes very hard. So mm -hmm. net energy in this country per capita was rising to 1970, started flattening out and it's been going down ever since. It exactly mirrors the difficulty people are describing mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in the average person getting by because that's what we're divvying mm -hmm. up is the surplus it's energy. It's the surplus that's energy. that's the real wealth. And that's, and Everything that's, else is a way And that's why that. I'm saying that the great task of our time is learning how to be poor with dignity. Yes, we're poverty. We're all going to deal with it. But it's possible to live tolerably well on a lot less than the extreme, the extravagant mm -hmm. If we divvy it up well and egalitarian-like uh, and, and, and civilly, not, but mm -hmm. we might not. Yeah, but the, yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's, and that's why yeah. that's why we have a lot of very hard choices to make, and the people who are but that the, is an the people who are among the relatively privileged, those who are of the salary class, who have the, a, a larger share of benefits from the system than say, you know, the people who are working three part-time jobs, minimum wage, no benefits, mm -hmm. trying to keep their children fed. It's the privileged people who need to actually look at their lives and say, okay. I need to use less. I need to oh, live. forget about like, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, I get this all the time. My experience. An 11 year old child in school wouldn't propose that. My, my experience <laughs> is that most, most affluent Americans would sooner die in a fire than do anything that would make their neighbors think they were poor. Yeah, to that's probably true. Um, I, I see a, a big problem with uh, the public policy approach to making the world a better place. Um, probably comes again from my bias as an engineer. Engineers are allergic to things that don't work. So an engineer looks at something and says, does it work? And if the answer is no, then the follow-up question is, when was the last time it worked? Um, <laughs> and if the answer is never, then it's like, okay, <laughs> off with it, in the but dumpster. Dimitri, so you were talking about, pub about public planners in the Soviet Union, how much they accomplished. That worked. Exactly. So, so public policy so can to give, function. To give you, to give you an example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I believe in government-provided health care, just not this government. <laughs> okay. You know? Okay. I, I, I believe in a rational defense mm -hmm. establishment, just not this one. Okay? <laughs> well, we don't have a rational you know? defense and establishment. And I believe in democracy, no, and I just don't believe that this is one. <laughs> okay? So those are perfectly concrete examples okay. based on, on my understanding. And so why would I invest my time in something that I don't think has ever worked and don't think it ever will, because if it hasn't worked until now, why, why should we expect it to do better now that 
the problem has become more difficult. Uh, so what people can do instead is instead of public policy, they can pursue uh, private community policy. They, you know, they can have a policy that, that they will not you know, sign up for electric service to, to their dwelling or buy municipal water. Uh, they, they can have a policy where they will refuse to take on debt. Mm -hmm. uh, they will have a policy where they refuse to keep their money in a bank. You know, those are all personal policies that they can make. And if enough people make them, then that will be a transformative moment for, for the society as a whole. We're surrounded by people who have policies like that right in this county. And they're, they're doing quite well with it, and their children are doing well. Their children actually have a viable future. Um, and the other thing is that we're, we're heading toward a time where we are going to have to resort to clever tricks in order to survive. Public policy always gets formulated on the basis of certain assumptions as to what people will do. But if you're in an environment where any particular trick, the effectiveness of any particular trick is inversely proportional to the number of people trying to use it, okay, you, do not, you cannot make rational assumptions about human behavior. So whatever policy you formulate will fail because everybody will look for a loophole in it. Because that's the initial thing they'll do. Is they'll, you give them a machine to use and they'll figure out how to break it because that's where the, that's where the sweet spot is in, 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 a declining, mm -hmm. in a declining social scheme is how to thwart it, how to get around it, you know, how to I trick it. I never thought I'd be in the position of talking as the optimist about America. It's <laughs> 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 an unusual place for me to be. Uh -huh. like, uh, <laughs> but, you know, when we're talking about scarcity mm -hmm. and about people adapting to scarcity, mm -hmm. I can talk about that. I can talk mm -hmm. about poor and black. Over, over generations mm -hmm. have adapted to scarcity and, and inhumane mm -hmm. kinds of, of conditions. So I, I think that the optimism is that uh, folks will, folks learn. Oh, yeah. For, folks learn and, and adapt in a better mm -hmm. way than I think that we're expressing ar around here. Whether it's, it's in health, whether it's in community, whether it's in developing organizations that, that mm -hmm. sometimes we've let go mm -hmm. uh, because we didn't. And I think that that's what's not being understood or, or, or played out mm -hmm. here. More to the point, that's exactly what's not, not, what's not happening. Not We're yet. not adapting. Not yet. We're well, not adapting. Not, not yet. Yeah. No, some yeah. no, some no, people think, have to adapt I think you're to survive. Right. And, and they are. Uh, the poor learn a lot about how to mm -hmm. survive. In, in my damn state of Texas, uh, the TANF for a family of four, which is, is, is $218 a month living on that. Uh, and so the, they learn how to adapt. Mm -hmm. And I'm simply saying that, that I think that, that, that we can too, but it's, 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 it's at a declining relationships at a different point than we are, and with decisions that could change that more positively on distribution that we're not making yet. Mm -hmm. Like what? Oh, well, you're, taxes, you're, taxes, you're man, from, from, from taxes, no, 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 from, from taxes to a value-added tax, uh, which we're not, our, our consumption tax, to uh, trade policy. I mean, there's just a lot of, to investments in infrastructure, which are going to be job-created, mm -hmm. too. Uh, they're, just, mm -hmm. they're just numerous kinds of things that we're not, choices that we have not made, that we could make, that mm -hmm. could make this whole scenario completely mm -hmm. different. I don't think it'll make it completely different. But I think, it can, I think you're right that there are choices that can be made that will improve things in the short term. And in the long term, of course, we'll adapt. Well, the survivors will yeah, adapt. Exactly. Our grandchildren will adapt. Um, but it's a long, rugged road. And um, while there are public policy choices that would certainly benefit the situation, to cut some slack for people, um, our entire political system is going the opposite direction. And the bipartisan, by the way, both sides are pushing straight in the opposite direction yeah, right. with all the force they've got. So it's important to it's important, I think, to keep to keep hammering on the fact, you know, there are better ways we can do this, but don't count on any particular political leadership to get there. Well, 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 there's, well, there's, another, there's another point to be made, which is okay, you have the Republicans and the Democrats who are, you know, shadow boxing with themselves or whatever it is they're doing. I can't figure it out. But um, then there's uh, the population, a big chunk of which now thinks that I'm from the government and I'm here to help are fighting words. 
-hmm. based on what they've seen. It's yeah. impossible to get these people on your side because they don't trust you. Mm -hmm. if, if, if your tool is public policy, then they think that you're going to do the same thing you were doing before. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their starting assumption. So it's very difficult. Because they assume that public policy is meant to screw them over. Exactly. And because so often that's been the case. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a hard road to hoe, no question. Yeah. Now, Frank, I consider myself a, a realistic optimist. And the realism comes in, here's what we learned in 2008 and 9. We learned that our system was within hours of systemic collapse. We know that because Hank Paulson wrote it in his memoirs, Mervyn mm -hmm. King, former governor of the Bank of England, wrote it in his memoirs. We know it because Wall Street Journal wrote this article that at 2 in the morning on that October night when uh, the, the CEO of Citibank was being called into this emergency meeting, he stopped at the ATM and took cash out because he's like, I don't even know if this thing's going to be working in the morning. <laughs> so true story. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we got that close. And, and, and the, the summary of that for me is that we have a financial system that is either expanding or collapsing. It doesn't do steady state. Look at Japan, the world's largest floating retirement colony, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's aging rapidly and it's losing population and they're doing everything they can monetarily to jam the, make it grow faster. The people of Japan don't need a growing economy. They could mm -hmm. be serviced perfectly well with a shrinking one because they're shrinking. They mm -hmm. could change that with new immigration policies yeah. possibly, but they're not, but they're not gonna. Yeah. So yeah, they, look at the robots. They need to live into that reality, but they're not living into that reality. So, so what, what are they doing? They now have over a million dollars of debt in the society associated with every household. And there's this much chance of any household paying back a million in debt. Oh, so, so what are they doing? They're piling more debt on top of that. So what I do when I talk about the eight forms of capital is say, look, the reality is they are going to keep driving that system until it breaks. And I think that break moment is bad enough that mm -hmm. individually the most responsible, prudent thing I know how to do is to buy insurance on this story. So I build my eight forms of capital up. I hope that I'm not right, right? I might be wrong, but I'm not confused, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, they are driving a system that I see as, has no future. And I get that. And that's a, I'm a, I actually have made my peace with that. There's nothing I can do about that from a real big policy standpoint. But unless we change the story that sits under all of this, we don't get those policies. We don't get, you know. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm with you guys with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I understand the, but, the difficulties. I just think we're not. But there are, po there are policy things that could be done. There are choices, even if right. As long as we done. recognize yeah. that there, there are choices, and so there's some there probability are. of those choices. But, but I think of, getting... of folks wising up and making better kinds of choices, and mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's uh, well, you know, your organization is associated with uh, population and immigration issues. And, and, you know, I'm bewildered by one part of the immigration story. You know, the idea that it's compulsory that we have to let everybody from every part of the world come here. You know? Mm -hmm. we, we, there was another, another era in American history in the 1920s, in the mid-1920s, after about 70 years of really robust immigration during the buildup of the industrial economy of the United States from, you know, from nearly no industrial economy to a major, the do world dominating economy by the early 20th century. And you know, we, we uh, had this tremendous wave of immigration. And then in 1923, there was a consensus among all parties concerned, let's take a time out from immigration. There wasn't a big battle about it. There wasn't. There weren't people hurling moral insults at each other over it. In fact, it was the it, populist. It was settled very it. expeditiously in Congress. They passed an Immigration Reform Act, and we had a timeout from immigration. I don't know why we can't have a coherent uh, uh, conversation about that now. Great. You know, but I, I, I wish we could. In, you know, myself, I'm the son of an immigrant. My mother came here in 1952, and it was at that time when those restrictions that started in the mid-1920s were mm -hmm. very much in place. And oddly enough, it, it, it's an era of time where, it's a period in time where we built the middle class in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When my mother came here, it was a good time for immigrants. It was a good time for native-born. Mm -hmm. And largely because, again, we got back supply and demand. Supply. They, yep. they, that in 1952, they issued 178,000 green cards. Mm -hmm. We bring in about a million people a year Legally, legally into the U.S. That's right. And it's at a time, and this is why I love you know, Charles Hugh Smith's writings, where he mm -hmm. talks about this robotization that is going on. So here we are not only offshoring jobs and mm -hmm. jobs being uh, removed due to efficiency, mm -hmm. we also have the, the 
the technology mm -hmm. improving to where jobs are just being eliminated and, altogether at and, a time when we should have a decreasing mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. Well, which would be survivable and sustainable. But you know, we, we can't have this conversation. All we are having is, all we're hearing are sob stories. Yes. And sentimental arguments. Well, we're a nation of immigrants, so the Statue of Liberty is so glorious, you know? Yeah. These are childish sob stories. Well, it's not a conversation. But it, it's very convenient if you don't want to talk about the fact that, right. um, impo that beggaring the working class promotes the prosperity of the salary class. Yep. And that's, that's the unspeakable yes. reality of American life. Driving the working class into destitution maintains the middle and upper middle class in their current state of, of economic comfort. And so nobody wants to talk about it for understand, you know, understandably. It is a standard part of the identity of the salary class that they're the good people, the compassionate people, the people who care. And the fact that their lifestyles are built on the destruction of the American working class. Well, it's not just and the working class. But not which, just the working class. Yes, but it's increasingly up with the, oh, it's, the middle class. Well, it's outsourcing, it's we're ex talking it's even expanded higher. Because it, ha it has to keep on accelerating as our, as our access to real wealth declines. You have to throw more and more people under the bus. But because of that, mor that moral posturing, that is so fashionable these days that everyone wants to see themselves as the good people that, you know, and so on. You can't talk about that. And uh, you know, every time that I've discussed class issues in my blog, oh, the tantrums, <laughs> oh, the, the, the fainting spells, the fantods, and uh, people, people go ape. Mm -hmm. Because you're not supposed to talk about that because we want to maintain the facade of niceness. Well, we're talking about so, now. So, so uh, I know. what would you do about immigration? What would I do about immigration? Yeah, what, do you have States? an idea, a notion about where we should be at with immigration? I'd start by enforcing the laws we actually have. Mm -hmm. Amen. OK. And then I would start a realistic conversation in this country within the political system about how many people we can actually absorb from other countries, mm -hmm. not on a cultural basis, yeah, on an economic yes. basis. How many jobs can we provide? Yes. And no, this would require a lot of other changes. You, Dimitri, you were talking about it, the housing policies that maintain housing at an absurd price while millions of units sit empty. Yes. Mm -hmm. That could be changed with some simple public policy. The screams would be heard on Neptune. <laughs> but, you know, the, but we, need, we, could, we could actually address this. We, we could. could actually talk about how many people can the US economy absorb from other countries every year. Which is the model well, for other industrial is, relations. That it's, are what everybody do, it's what everybody yeah. else does. Yes. That's yeah. what a lot of countries are doing. So I'm, I'm a first generation immigrant, and you know, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of immigrants and mm -hmm. have lived as one. Uh, there are a lot of angles to this. One is that. Uh, you know, board, national borders are very inconvenient from the corporate point of view. Um, uh, corporations like to treat labor as fungible, as a fungible commodity. Mm -hmm. uh, basically shipping it to wherever it's required and then shipping it out again when it's no longer required. Uh, it creates this uh, homogenous cosmopolitan society where nobody is invested in any particular place and that makes, it, makes, makes them very easy to manipulate and control. Mm -hmm. um, and destroys any sense of place that they might have had. Mm -hmm. Yes, it destroys the working class, especially in the United States, because there are all these people, uh, you know, not highly trained, that slosh over the border and and, and do uh, uh, simple jobs. Uh, on the other hand, the United States would collapse without a highly trained uh, specialist um, uh, foreign labor. Um, most of the corporations in the U.S. are completely at, at the mercy of, of these guest workers. Mm -hmm. So I, I see that happening as well. And, and then a lot of these people are going home. A lot of people get degrees in the U.S. and then just go home these days because they don't see a future for themselves and their kids in the U.S. A lot of mm -hmm. them stay here for a while, they work, then they have children. And the moment they have children, it's like back to the home country. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, because they don't want to lose their children to America. <laughs> when you and, say and, and there's a lot of emphasis now, and I, lot of, I know a lot of people like that who are immigrants in name only. They're really migrants. They're here while the grass is greener for them in, mm -hmm. in their particular situation, but they're not going to lose their roots in the sense well, of well. Speaking you know, about while the grass is green, why do we assume that the corporate model of of doing business as it has been for the last 30, 40 years is necessarily going to continue? I wouldn't make that assumption. I, I think like, like everything else that's overscaled 
in our world, mm -hmm. th th uh, that kind of corporate enterprise is in trouble and, it, and it's probably gonna... Uh, what I'm trying to say is the most rational, well-reasoned immigration policy you have where you block um, all, of, all of the migrants, the economic migrants that will steal jobs where you allow all the highly trained people who you want to come and join you and be the, the all-American success story, none of that will work. First of all, a whole bunch of people will sneak in and will be very hard to toss out again. Secondly, all of the highly skilled people are going to go back home the moment the situation turns. And they're already doing it. So there isn't really a good policy to work out. Well, when you say that, that America, high-tech companies can't function without high external skilled people, that, that, that doesn't m mesh with the, the evidence. They say that, as we saw, I don't know if one saw 60 Minutes last week, with the abuses of the H-1B program, uh, the corporations want cheaper labor. And they want labor who has requirements to that corporation for five years to get a, in order before they can get a green card. So we're not really, you know, we, we have, once again, if we're talking reality, mm -hmm. we have a lot of myths here. We have corporate high-tech execs having to train their replacements. So the, 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 skilled, mm -hmm. the skilled chefs and the others, mm -hmm. those are minimal parts of the H-1B program that, well, that have been abused. Fact, right? I, Specifically, I it's key technical skills. The it's, of labor. it's mostly in engineering and science. Mm -hmm. And there are just, there, in a lot of cases, there just aren't enough specialists going through the master's and PhD programs in mm -hmm. sciences and engineering in the well, United States. Well, see, this comes right back to something that I can talk about because I did papers, analysis. The one time, front page of the New York Times, April of 1992, which I pointed out by going into this, uh, uh, really looking at this for a number of years, uh, one of the reasons we don't have Americans uh, in, in the sciences of that day is because you had uh, American faculties that gave uh, preferences to non-citizens. It, it really was. Mm -hmm. the assumption, there were certain assumptions that academic departments make mm -hmm. about the uh, the GRE, mm -hmm. the educate, and I've been on the, the board of the GRE too. The assumptions are that this is an exam that is testing aptitude, not achievement. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's clearly clearly wrong. And so you have departments making judgments about supposedly going after the mm -hmm. best talent mm -hmm. and ignoring the fact that there are privileged folks from overseas. Many times that we're being. Mm -hmm. Cap capitalized, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Kaplan program, or they have whatever the versions were, specially trained. Mm -hmm. And elites uh, coming from South Asia, being 95% Brahmin, never the Dali, in other words, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uh, class based, privileged folks coming from mm -hmm. overseas against others, mm -hmm. and then making judgments that, that you're getting the best and the brightest. And our own folks, even, it was interesting, even American Asian minorities mm -hmm. who didn't benefit from those kinds of supports were not being funded adequately. And, and this one final thing mm -hmm. was the preference of what I call academic bragging rights, you know, to be able to say that, oh, uh, I visited my student in Hamburg or in South Asia, they're not going to say, I visited my student and I'm trying to think of what is the Lancaster, Trent, West, Trent uh, West Lancaster, or, or 14th in Harlem or, yeah. or that. Yeah. And, and this, this kind of academic yeah. bias, you know, mm -hmm. strongly influenced us. We're not talking equal playing field. There, there's another very straight, straightforward financial thing there, which is that Many universities, many American universities now balance their budget by bringing in, by bringing in students from out of the country who pay a premium cost. Absolutely they're not right. Gonna, they're, and so, yeah, so it, there, obviously there are some changes that would have to be made to, to, to fix that. But it's, it's doable if there's the will to do it. Great. Well, on that, we're going to wrap up the panel discussion, but I would like to throw it open to questions and answers from our audience uh, for about five, ten minutes, maybe. Great. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, so we'll go uh, up front, front row. Yeah, I have a question well, I wanted to thank oh. everyone. Can, they, can the audience, can, oh, no, can they hear? No, I'll repeat the question. Oh, okay. okay. First of all, it's fantastic to have this group together. I think this has been a fantastic presentation. <clears throat> the question I had seemed like early in the discussion, there was this conversation about some historic precedents for our current situation of civilization. Oh, we'd have a mic coming past. around. Oh, there okay. we go. We're, why don't you go ahead and ask the question again? Go ahead and ask the question. Okay. Oh, other way. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, in any case, uh, the question I had was it seems like there was some illusion early on in the 
conversation about different kinds of precedents, you know, mm -hmm. but in recent American history, in more ancient civilizations, for some of the challenges that we face today. My perception is that folks are not really conversant, probably myself included, in a lot of these kind of examples. And I'm wondering if there is any sense that our current situation, we have a greater degree of historic amnesia right now than we do in the past, or if this is <coughs> just kind of a recurrent phenomenon. If this is totally normal. When the Roman Empire was sliding, nobody thought to look at how the last half dozen empires had gone down. It was just not on the table. Um, being completely blind to historical parallels is a recurring historical phenomenon. And even though we, we in America are obsessive about history, we're not obsessive to that kind, about that kind of history. Next question. Hi, I want to. I want to oh, say I'm sorry. Oh, go, on, go. I'm just sorry. on that same on that same topic, I come with a much more recent example. Uh, everyone remembers Martin Luther King's uh, great saying, if you quote someone else, that the arc of history always moves toward justice. Uh, but for African Americans, the, the lessons of history are not that. The lessons of history is that after the Fourteenth Amendment, Thirteen, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth, uh, Supreme Court changed those completely against the almost the interests of those who they were for. The 14th Amendment was much better for corporate than for America. For, and then uh, they interpreted uh, Plessy versus Ferguson in 96. And so after the election of Obama, there was the assumption of, you know, maybe it's great racial, uh, 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 race blind society. But we, what we really see is that that is simply, certainly was never the case, is not the case. And a great book by Carol Anderson called White Rage, uh, she's a professor from uh, uh, Emory, uh, just really points out that uh, there's always a, there's a reaction. And to not to be aware of history and not to expect the reaction, uh, we pay very, very dearly. I, I have a simpler answer, too, for all of this, which is that um, to learn from history would be an act of insight. Uh, humans, psychologically, we know that we tend to change through pain, not insight. I mean, that's just 99% that's just of change happens through the pain side. Very rarely, <laughs> <laughs> so you can get the insight and go, oh, I, maybe I shouldn't do that. Sometimes, right? sometimes it hurts enough that we notice the insight. <laughs> sometimes it hurts enough that we actually do something in response to it. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Yep. So this question follows on that theme, and that is that Given that we are in this recurring cycle of humanity, and humanity doesn't, you know, our emotional brain and, and makeup is not much different than we were 30, 40,000 years ago sitting around a campfire. But the thing that I would like to hear you comment upon is techno technology disruptors. Because what has changed humanity and our, is technology. It's brought on wars, it's brought on development, it's brought on colonization. Mm -hmm. The speed, the acceleration rate of technology I'm not a technology buff, I'm not, but, but the point is, disruptors are changing. And mm -hmm. so whatever's gonna happen, we, we, none of us might not see something that's gonna come out of left field. That's gonna make a difference, and they, these technology disruptors are gonna come faster and faster. And I'd like, just like, I'm sure you've thought about this or discussed this in some of your, your Well, blogs. I think about it a lot. I wrote a book of, uh, called Too Much Magic, Wishful Thinking, Technology, and the Fate of the Nation. And uh, you know, I, I think that we entered a period of accelerated wishful thinking after the crash of 2008, and that we have much too much emotion vested in the idea that technology is going to help us through this particular bottleneck of, of human history. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of that um, line of thinking. If, if I'm, this, is, this is actually central to much of the work that I've done. Um, a number of studies have shown that the pace of technological innovation in modern times was actually reached in the 1890s. Okay? This is absolute heresy, by the way. But in fact, if you look at most of the technologies we're using nowadays, many of them date from the 19th century. The automobile was a 19th century invention. The internal combustion engine, which made air flight possible. There have been plenty of inventions since then, but the, number, the amount of actual disruptive technology has actually decreased steadily. At this point, people are, are whooping about disruptive technology when it's a minor improvement to a semiconductor chip. Okay? Now, technology, is technology a factor? Of course, it has always been a factor. Um, iron weapons were a huge technological disruptor in their day. But the, what I see is people equipped with amazing complex technologies who are making exactly the same mistakes that were being made in Egypt and Babylon 
with exactly the same consequences. So to some extent, I think the technology is an excuse. It's a way to say, well, we don't have to learn the lessons of history. They don't apply to us. It's, you know, it's different now. Here, I'll wave my iPhone to prove it. Can, and, let me, can I finish and the a same, thought? And that, the same problem. The, the Go ahead. thought that I started a few minutes ago. Go ahead. Well, the, the other thing that we're completely blind to are the diminishing returns of technology. Thank you. You know, we spent about, I don't, I'm just guessing now, we spent, let's say, $50 billion and 40 years uh, computerizing the phone system in, in the United States in order to improve communications. And now you can't talk to a human being on the phone. And the reception on a cell phone is so bad, it's like you're talking to somebody underwater. <laughs> so did we, you know, how, how did we improve communications in the last 40 years, really? Um, I, I want to give you a very simple model to think, that you can use to think about technology. Suppose technology is this black box, right? Okay, and it puts out product, right? And provides services, so that's the output. What's the input? The input is non-renewable natural resources. And how many of those non-renewable natural resources are running out as we speak? How many of them will still be available in meaningful quantities uh, in 20 years, let's say? Well, it turns out just about everything we're using right now as far as non-renewable natural resources, with the possible <coughs> exception of bauxite, which is used to smelt aluminum, will become scarce. So what's going to happen to your black box when that happens? The answer is it will no longer be useful. It'll be like a nail gun when you don't have any nails. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but you're saying that we'll still have an ample supply of tinfoil hats. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably, yes. Well, and, and so, but I think the other piece that's being discussed over here too is that technology has two sides. We tend to focus on the optimistic side in this country in particular. It's just, oh, look at all the great stuff we get from technology. You know, virtually every problem we face is the result of a solution that somebody implemented. So we're mm -hmm. kind of caught on this treadmill of needing new technology to solve the stuff we just got through. The only thing that would really change my outlook on this is some vast improvement in battery technology using very common materials that can be scaled up very rapidly. That would change, that would get, that would really change the story for me, at least during my lifetime and my children's lifetime. After that, there would be other things that would result and emerge as problems from that solution. But that would be the thing that would really change this. The, the fact that we can have self-driving cars, and these are all nibbling at the edges for me. The main predicament, once you understand it and you can really look at quadrillions of BTUs coming into this black box from somewhere, which is to totally non-renewable place, and outputting everything, uh, until, we, until we start to master that, I think we have to be prepared for. We're not gonna expand at the same rate we did, and we have a financial system that's either expanding or collapsing. What's possible in Greece today is a skinny fraction of what was possible five, six years ago before their economy collapsed. They can't do anything there now. That's what I'm concerned about is that we will sort of blunder into a failure to understand that we can't expand our economy forever. We're gonna have this over-reliance on technology, we'll think of something. <laughs> but as Frank and I were talking about earlier, we already have the technologies to do this better today, but we're not using them. So it's not a failure of technology. It's a failure of imagination, of something, and, right? And of wealth, available wealth to put all of these things into effect. Again, a contracting economy does not have the resource base of an expanding economy, and those start imposing limits on what you can actually get done. And that's one of the things I think we're really running into, and people do not want to hear it. We've got to have our Star Trek future. So you know what to work on now. Figure out a way to build batteries out of landfill. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of a, it's a, called a renewable compost. solar yeah. source. <laughs> <laughs> a renewable solar source. You just get a potato and plug it into the top. <laughs> OK, any more questions? One more question? Hi, well, I want to thank you for the panel, but I, I kind of want to point to a question that I think is being missed from all of your perspectives, and that's the role of community or the good life. Sorry, if you could, I'll speak up if I have the mic. It might sound like idealism to speak about the good life, but how do we counter the alienation of labor, the displacement of peoples, when your, your discussion of poverty, I think, really highlights this well. Poverty is a concept we've created when we only acknowledge people who have an income. We have many people, this, you see this in the critique of the UN Sustainable mm. Development Goals. People who are not recognized are the ones who live on the land, rural agrarian com communities who can support themselves. So if that's the end goal for sustainability, they become invisible in the ways that they're recognized by mm -hmm. the free market economy. 
And yet, at the same time, you're blaming the immigrants, you're blaming humans for living when we're dealing with economic injustice, we're dealing with distribution issues. So I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd like to see, okay. I suppose I'm curious what, what, if I could frame in terms of oppression, I'm thinking out loud a bit, um, but where does the role of community and inclusivity fit into this discourse of economic justice and the okay. distribution of wealth? Okay, and how first, do we kind of respond to that? Yeah. First of all, who's blaming anybody? Well, I suppose I was hearing I, I a bit of a, res as maybe I misinterpreted I, I think you're discussion. misinterpreting that. Okay, so when, when, can, I, can I respond to that? Yeah. So what I, what I was hearing was, oh, we need to limit the number of immigrants. That's right. so you hear this in the overpopulation discourse as well. Uh -huh. If we have a 1% of the population that's, that has um, has the majority of the wealth, right? Mm -hmm. If you see these numbers, distri it's distribution that's the issue. We can, we can, this is Brexit all over again. You can limit immigrants, they have to live somewhere. Mm -hmm. But if you can focus on that overconsumption component, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that population isn't an issue, I'm not okay. saying that numbers games do not matter, but the rhetoric is to continuously focus on population and to blame the newcomers. But look at the consumption, look at uh -huh. that disproportion of wealth, that same reason we hesitate to do that mm -hmm. inequality discussion. Uh -huh. I'm hearing bits of that here. Now maybe I'm projecting. But, I, bit, I, but I honestly yeah, think you're projecting so because we've been discussing the whole mm -hmm. maldistribution issue. We've discussed the centralization of wealth. Chris had some numbers to say among many others. We've discussed that, mm -hmm. but it's also true that in the real world limits exist. Sure. Absolutely. And it's, you know, poverty, I, when we mm -hmm. talk about poverty, we have to remember that can include the kind of poverty that means you can't get enough to eat. Absolutely. Okay, and that's not necessarily all maldistribution. There are actual ecological limits. How much of the planet do we want to devour? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, the points that you're making are relevant, but they have to be taken into context, and so often they're not. So often they're treated as absolutes, as moral absolutes, mm -hmm. and used to override the brutal physical realities that underlie this, the, the fact that we are totally dependent on the breakneck consumption of non-renewable resources okay. to support a standard of living that can no longer be supported. Could I provide one example for what I'm thinking of to help share? So, um, for instance, I was thinking of Trump's presidential address where he said that we see that um, uh, compassion can be reckless is a point that he made. We're mm -hmm. thinking about immigration and coming numbers. Mm -hmm. This is a threat to our economy. Mm -hmm. So it's not that just allowing free, free this is the free market or the, the, the endless growth concern, right? We don't want to have unlimited, unrestrained growth. But at the same time, why are we focusing on the, the individuals, those number games, mm -hmm. rather than community and the economic justice piece? I suppose mm -hmm. that's how I'd want to phrase okay. it. So thank you for letting me think that out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I finally mm -hmm. got there, so thanks. Okay. Can I start with that? I think that whenever we were talking about, I certainly have, in terms of, of economic justice and distribution and policy and choices, because that's what really it gets down to are things from tax policies, uh, uh, fiscal policies, uh, things like a, a, a consumption policy that mm -hmm. where the resources could be used. Because we're going in conditions of scarcity, assuming that. We, assuming that we're correct, that we're in conditions of scarcity and the pie is getting smaller, then I think it's really much more important that these kinds of choices be not only clear, but that they be made. And it, it's usually, as Americans, it seems that we only make choices like this when we're in emergencies. We don't, mm -hmm. if we're not in an emergency, you know. And I think that in the 30s, in the 1930s, when we had the Depression, when it became clear that more of us or less, we were all in the same boat. Race didn't quite overcome it, but it was it was it was it was you know clearer then that uh, that that folks were to, that the necessity of, of of moving toward a co more collective social contract contract and less individualism. It was in mm -hmm. the 30s. It was not you were not perceived if you were poor as as individual failures, mm -hmm. and there was a recognition that. Things, something collectively had to be across mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. The system yeah. was, was structurally mm -hmm. under okay. pressure. And, and maybe that's what it's going to take. I believe that as we begin to go down that, and I think that the Trump presidency is, is one indication that we're, we're going down that road, that we're beginning to get a, a, a clearer uh, picture. Americans are going to get a clearer picture that the elites of both parties are screwing us, you know. And that there are that that we're looking for for choices. It's going to be clear that maybe that Trump is not the answer. That's going to become very clear too. But anyway, whatever that the answer is, that we need to be that we're seeking an answer to that. And and what the panel was saying quite correctly, uh, that there are dangers there, but but there are always 
They're always mm -hmm. dangerous. Uh, whether on one side there's the danger of the autocrat, the other side the dangers uh, that we are suffering from the elite further concentration that will make mm -hmm. this the, these distribution choices uh, much mm -hmm. uh, further down the pike than they would be otherwise. But they will. I think they will be made, and I think that uh, as it gets worse, uh, the, 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 our visions, our clarity will get will get better about uh, who is said. Who's hurting us? <laughs> Who's really doing the hurt? You know, mm -hmm. uh, because you know it's not so easy to to blame the immigrants, and you can't blame the black welfare queens anymore because we cut out welfare and so forth. Now, uh, that that who is it? You know, uh, mm -hmm. who is it? Why are we hurting? Uh, and uh, what needs to to be done about it? Because I'm still going to be there, still taxing me, and they're still you know uh, will will put me in jail if I get drunk. So uh, what do I, what do I need, need to do? And I, hopefully it won't just be, as I mentioned earlier, an escape into further addiction and, and mental illness. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but there will be in alcoholism, but there will be these other kinds of recognition choices. And the institutions, the institutions that have seen to have, that have taken the back seat, as Putnam calls them, bowling the law that those institutions, those collective institutions, from the labor unions uh, um, to the churches to the fraternal organizations where people get together and start really uh, thinking about uh, the basis, uh, could form the spaces of a collective grassroots movement that we, that we clearly do not have now because maybe not enough people are hurting yet or have figured it out. Now, I've, I've got to add on to that, which is that um you know, we live in a hierarchical society. It's got a big pyramid. There have been a lot of them, Mayans, you know, all the way through. When people live in hierarchical societies, this is based on, on um, work by Daniel Quinn, right? We can talk about how we're going to fight and do policies and organize to get the top of the pyramid to throw some more scraps down towards the bottom. It's rear guard action. It always fails. Uh, we discover that in times of when things get tight, that really clamps down. The Iron Triangle just clamps shut and it's, it's over. So that's one model, but what I love what Dimitri said is once you recognize where we are and you say, wait a minute, if you understand how this is actually structured, we actually have all the power. We're not victims in this story unless we consent to be victims. Oh my God, we're not getting all this stuff. Well then check out. Don't be part of the Iron Triangle. Figure out how to community organize. There's so much we can do in this, but it begins with breaking the narrative, which is we're powerless, they have all the power, we're gonna have to fight for scraps. Do that all you want, take a whole life of, of incredible progressive activism, go for it, I'm glad people do it, but it's ultimately a losing battle. The real uh, battle is to free ourselves from the mindset of what of control that's in, in here and come at it from a completely different angle. And so to circle back, Daniel Quinn said the only way that has ever worked to seize that power back is not fight for it, it's to abandon the failing system. I want to add uh, a couple of things to, to that. First of all, when you say that we should be merciful towards Im newcomers, immigrants, uh, one thing that you're not saying but that a lot of people hear immediately is that you're not going to be merciful to people who've been here for generations who are having a horrible time and you're prioritizing newcomers over their needs, which is to them manifestly unfair. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that, well, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about community, but we're in Lancaster County, and the strongest communities here are uh, the Amish and the Mennonites. And what is the most striking feature of those communities? <laughs> they are separatist. They will have nothing to do with you that they don't want to do with you. They do not accept immigrants at all. They do not recruit. And yet they've persisted for 500 years. They've gone through situations of horrible martyrdom and, and privation and have survived. So if you want to look at communities, look at them, look at the principles by which they operate. They put their own children before everyone else in the world. That's why they're still around. Thank you. Oh, we're going to take some questions from the internet right now. All right, this is a question from the Friends of the CROM group on Facebook. I'm going to paraphrase it because it was pretty long. but. Someone who is uh, an engineer and a permaculturalist and who's been listening to the podcast and is familiar with all of you and all of your arguments and has been thinking about this for a long time, he writes in to say that when he tries to talk about these issues with the people in his life, it just damages his relationships because 
people don't want to hear it. So he finds that his, his communications, his conversations become very superficial. And he's very busy. He has to earn a living. And he wants to know how to build social cohesion when really most of the time you're stuck having these really superficial daily conversations mm -hmm. and your time is taken up with making a living. How do you find mm -hmm. the others? How do you build a community that recognizes all the issues that you've been zeroing mm -hmm. in on and uh, you know, collaborates effectively to meet the challenge? Mm -hmm. um, I'll take that. Um, it's <coughs> impossible to drive people away from something because where do they go? Um, you, you can criticize the status quo all, all you want, and you can even propose ways of changing that, but until you do, you do not, you're not really offering anything except words. Uh, what you can do is draw people towards something, and the best way to engage someone is to give them something to do, something that teaches them, something mm -hmm. that produces a result. So if he's a permaculturalist, he knows how to grow stuff. And when you know how to grow stuff, that gives you an opportunity to feed people for free. And when you feed people, somehow that changes their brain chemistry in a way that makes them like you and obey you. So that is probably the approach he should take. OK. I'd, li I'd like to approach this from a slightly different angle. Because one of the things we're talking about here, one of the, the, the gap that, that this, this person has fallen into, is a religious disagreement. The established religion of this society is not Christianity. It's the worship of the great god progress. People in modern America and most industrial countries believe in progress the way med medieval peasants believed in the wonder-working powers of the bones of St. Sliven. Okay? Progress is going to save us. Progress is going to lift us up from the muck of the planet and, le and take us off to that Star Trek future that's splashed across our television screen. And when you challenge progress, you're literally telling somebody that God and his saints and angels are not, is not in heaven anymore. Yeah, they react very badly to that because it's their religion. That's where they put their hope of salvation. Mm. So it's a religious disagreement. It's a disagreement based on values. It goes very far down, and you need to recognize that that's there. You can't just explain to someone, well, you know, progress isn't going to, it is over. We had it. It's done. It was a function of, um, ex of, of uh, an extravagant surplus of energy. And okay, now we get to deal with, you know, people are not just going to, oh, okay. They're going to freak. They're going to lose it right there in front of you. I've had this happen many, many times. And so it's really crucial when you're looking at a situation like this to understand just how high the stakes are. An entire vision of human possibility, of human nature, of the future, of salvation, of hope, all of that depends on this fantasy of perpetual progress. And you take that away, and it gets real crunchy. So, so, so my understanding of that is just don't go there. Yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> OK? Offer them progress in the quality of, of, of the fruits and vegetables in their diet. <laughs> OK. I, I, I would. I would like to, to ask the person to uh, look at it from another way. Uh, one of the things that often none of us uh, really knows how, is how we really affect people over time. And one of the things that I was always told to do was to uh, really be prepared on things that you care about if you really want to try to persuade others is to have a 30-second version of it. You know, they call it going up the elevator version. And um, once you have that, you, you can explain it to the person. And if they're, if they're not receptive, then you don't really need to, to pursue it. But you never know. You really do never know, especially those of us who have been teaching undergraduates or, or <laughs> others for a while. You never know when it, when it, when, when it has taken and, and how it has taken. So I tell, I tell the person not to give up, but thinking about condensing some of the things that are most meaningful for him or her and being able to let it ride back there, but, but being willing to bring it up again uh, sometime in the same, same way. And I have a, can I have time for a yeah. very, very slight? Uh, and I have a different orientation on this, which will hopefully complement, which is that please understand that this stuff we're sharing is not information. It's belief challenging material. When you challenge somebody's beliefs, that's an emotional, not an intellectual process. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, to be influential when presenting emotionally challenging material, you can't have your own emotion involved. 
So for a while, I had my own emotion, which was sort of um, hyperactive, angry guy. And uh, pretty <laughs> soon, I was talking to a bunch of hyperactive, angry people. And I realized I wanted to actually expand that choir a little bit, so I had to dial that back. Um, and so what I learned from that was our own emotional state attracts other people who share that, but it, re it repels everybody else. So it's not to be dispassionate, but you know, this is basically five stages of grief. You know, when you're facing your own mortality, that is the highest belief challenging material there is. Oh, I'm going to die, right? You come out of denial into bargaining, um, you know, anger, and depression, uh, depression and acceptance. acceptance. You come in, right? And there might be a few others we could put in there, but that's sort of a skinny version of it. That's actually the process I see people go through when we talk about this mm -hmm. material. They are somewhere in there. So compassion first for wherever they are is my first rule. And second is curiosity, like where are they with this stuff? Mm -hmm. And if they're there, to try and meet them where they are, not have them come to where I am. Good point. That's yeah, been that's where I've been that's most good. effective in all of this. Great. Well, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here in front of us and for all those watching us on the internet and who will be watching us in the future, because that's the great thing about YouTube, I want to thank you all for coming out today. This has been a really wonderful panel discussion. I want to thank the panelists. Each of you have done an amazing job. Uh, the, the information that got important. We're actually half an hour over, but I think that's okay. Uh, I, don't, I can't see, personally, I wouldn't see myself uh, stopping at two hours for this. And uh, that's it. I want to thank again Progressive for Immigration Reform for underwriting this event today. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.